Hello and welcome to a new episode of the Eastern Lariat Podcast, your show for news, notes, reviews and opinions on the world of Japanese pro wrestling here on cagematch.net. We're back already. I'm your host, Riga. He is Dylan. And uh, I figured there's stuff to talk about. Some stuff that we actually wanted to talk about on the show last week, we didn't get to. But now we are here. We have some more time, Dylan. And uh, yeah, we got some uh, some nice topics aligned, some Yoshi topics that we can discuss, some Noah, some Dragon Gate, and of course, the big one, the Windy City Riot Show from New Japan personally, including John Moxley, winning the world title, Dylan. How are you doing? Stringer, I'm so happy to be here. Another new episode. Love that we're getting to talk again, me and you, of course, but also talking to the people, the people all over the world, the people that love wrestling. That is, there are no rules when it comes to the Eastern Lariat. No. All, all the people out there, everybody's welcome. We have a very open door policy to everybody, no matter who you are, where you're at in the world. Hey, I've checked the numbers. We've got listeners from so many countries. Like I said, we have we went through that exercise before. You know there's <laughs> a lot uh, out there. But the thing that is well, that we care about is that you love wrestling, that you like Japanese wrestling, that you want to have fun, you want to do big things. And another Kaioken times 10 level episode I'm prepared to bring, and hopefully all the listeners out there appreciate it. Fantastic, Dylan. Yes. First off, before we go to the Yoshi topics, it's a rather sad topic. Akebono, he died yeah. at the age of 54 years, just a couple of days ago, actually. It, it is something that everybody that knew what was going on had to be prepared for eventually because... In 2017, he had his last match for DDT, actually, on the road to Rio Goku. It was a, a six-man tag match, and it's, it's pretty wild to think about who else was in this match, because it was Akebono teaming with Yasu Urano and Harashima against Yuto Aijima, Shigehiro Irie, and Yoshihiro Takayama. It has to be one of the last matches for Takayama as well. Let's see. Yeah. Wow. That's wild. Actually, like, the last match that Akebono had was, was on April 11, 2017. The last match for Takayama was on May 4, 2017. That's a crazy coincidence, actually. Yes, Akebono, he had some severe health issues, definitely because of of the size that he that he was in his uh, in his later days, even though he slimmed down um, for for some periods of his of his career and got in pretty great shape around the age uh, around the time of 2014, uh, he had some heart issues. I think that's that was the reason that he that he eventually died. I haven't actually checked the correct medical term there, but what he had. Uh, Akebono, Dylan, I. I first came across, I had to think about when I first actually saw him and I saw that he was in the real world tag league in 2005 with KG Muto. I don't recall watching that tournament actually. So I think the, the, the first time that I actually really saw him, I did not at the time see the WrestleMania match with the big show. The first time that I really saw him, I think, was in 2007 when he was in New Japan Pro Wrestling. And at that time, there really wasn't anything about him that that you'd think that he'd be a professional wrestler. He came across like a complete attraction and nothing else, not, not really something that was inbuilt into the, into the um, confines of pro wrestling. But... When Akebono eventually then came to All Japan Pro Wrestling in 2009, he really showed that he had a great mindset for pro wrestling. He learned very quickly 
how to move around the ropes and especially, and I've said that before on this show and I've said that before on Twitter plenty of times, especially for a man of his size, it's so important to have incredible timing because otherwise you will just crush the wrestlers you're working with inside the ring with the sheer mass of your body and the move that Akebono had mastered perfectly like no one else in, in, in his size was just the elbow drop that he was able to, to use to perfection, like I said. And for him, it was in, in the first couple of years, of course, he was more of a tag team wrestler. And there was this legendary tag team that he and Ryota Hama were part of Smop, of course, uh, derived from the uh, the Japanese band that the name comes from. And they won the All-Asia Tag Team title and also, uh, did they win the... No, they did actually not win the World Tag Team title. They only won the All-Asia Tag Team title twice. And it is the... Let me see. It is the second run of that the second title run of that, that had this incredible match at the 40th anniversary show of New Japan Pro Wrestling in All Japan in Rio Goku, where Smob defeated Strong BJ, Daisuke Sekimoto, and Yuji Kobayashi for the All Asia Tag Team title. I remember that I loved that match so much. And these two teams had just out of this world great chemistry inside the ring and um, I don't think that it, it was the only match that they had but this one definitely stood out yes and um, Akebono he would go on to win the NWA Intercontinental Tag Team Championship actually with Daisuke Sekimoto in 0-1 and finally then the Triple Crown in 2013 when he beat Zuwama and uh, he held on to the title until, let me see, when he dropped the title. He dropped the title to Jun Akiyama. There was a very short reign, and Zuwama won the title back from Jun Akiyama again. Akebono would win the title for a second time in 2015. I think that was also the year when he won the champion carnival tournament. Yes, 2015, he won the Champion Carnival Tournament in the final, defeating Zuwama. So those two were always aligned uh, with Akebono's history in All Japan Pro Wrestling. And uh, yeah, uh, he once again then lost the title to Jun Akiyama. And that very much led to his departure from All Japan Pro Wrestling in uh, 2015. And he developed a really weird relationship with giant Baba's widow as yeah. her as Baba's widow would kind of see him as the heir of 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 uh, Odo of the royal road of the king's road and she would gift him all these things that uh, that were belongings of giant Baba and uh, he got his Cadillac and he got a sofa that was gifted to him by Andre the Giant. I recently retweeted that and that got a lot of traction, actually. Lots of, lots of people retweeted that because it's such a wild story. And that was around the time also when he founded this new promotion that was called Udo, uh, the, the King's Road. Um, that really never went anywhere. It was just a yeah. very, very sad attempt of... Whatever it was, trying to revitalize the spirit of all Japan, but with a with a roster of people that really weren't able to to actually accomplish that, and they only had three shows. And of course, because of Akebono's status and his health issues, they didn't run any any more shows. And so this promotion slowly fizzled out. And uh, yeah, and also Motoko Baba also died in 2018. Akebono, he had a blog and we had some updates about him, but it never were any good updates. And so now in 2024, yeah. we heard that, that he sadly, sadly passed away. Yeah. Uh, I know that, first of all, you, you know, Akebono, his star was made in sumo before sure. pro wrestling. You, you know, like, I mean, you look at him. A legendary run in the sumo ranks where he was the first ever 
uh, for you know foreigner American to become Yokozuna status in sumo, which is like the highest level. You know, there's a big ranking system in sumo, which uh, you know, if you know it, you know it. If not, it you know, uh, it, it was the best one. Like he was, he was literally one of the best at his time and became a huge superstar off of that. And then after a while, you know, kind of like you mentioned, they did the thing. I think he actually did the stuff with the Big Show uh, in the WrestleMania match they had. That was before he actually wrestled in Japan as a yes, pro wrestler. Was his, it was one of his first outings in wrestling, actually. I wonder why they did that. I think they did a, a one match before that in WWE. Let me see. I, one match before that to introduce him. before. Yeah, he did like a squash or something. Just, hey, this is big yes. monster. <laughs> like so his first match was people. on SmackDown 294 against Eddie Vegas. Look at that. Like I said, um, Boss uh, Eddie. Know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. See, so uh, you know, but they did a thing. It was literally like, I mean, his run, if you want to call it that, was literally a week. They did like a match before, then WrestleMania, and then a match after, and that, and that was it. That's, that felt so out of place. Yeah, and I Just wonder why they did. It. Yeah, like I wonder why they did that in the first place. I can't really understand it from their their angle, but it was a great thing for him, and it led to him. You know, Keiji Muto, he's always been a big fan of the Western style, obviously. And obviously, Akibono is a star in Japan, so it led to him coming into that. I think that was around the time when the original Wrestle One was starting, mm -hmm. was, and Muto had him in for that. I think he was on that show, and then it led to the All Japan, and then just him as a freelancer. He was a big enough name to where he could go to other places like the New Japan. Yeah, and just one trivia note, Dylan, before that. Before Wrestle One, he did one more WWE match in Japan, actually, teaming with a big show and their opponents, just legendary opponents, Dylan in WWE, Carlito and Matt Morgan. Okay, well, listen, Carlito, we will not disrespect <laughs> I knew it. him. I knew it. <laughs> we will not disrespect Carlito on this show. But that is a really random team. I was a pretty – this era is like my era of WWE, like 2004, 2005. That WrestleMania show he was on was the same one of the first Money in the Bank match that inspired me to be a wrestler, like mm. literally, like Shelton running up the ladder. Like I, I remember that. I'll never forget it. So I remember that show very well, but I still don't quite remember Matt Morgan ever being on Raw, <laughs> like to be honest with you. Uh, uh, it was but... a Raw SmackDown Super Show in Saitama Super Arena. Oh, okay. Yeah, see, that, yeah, because I always thought of Matt as more of a, a SmackDown guy when he was there. Yes. Uh, Later, of course, the DNA of TNA. The DNA of TNA. They literally sent his DNA into space uh, <laughs> like when he was there. <laughs> but that's that's a whole other subject from what we're talking about right now. Um, <laughs> so stuff for the Matt Morgan podcast. <laughs> that that, that, anyone will surely do at some point. I think we, I think it's what the world needs ultimately. Uh, but yes, I do, I do knew, I knew it was like one match before, like very short stuff, then the sumo match, and then the one match after. Uh, so I, then that was it. Like it was such a short run. Uh, I don't know what they accomplished with it. I guess maybe just because they were going to Japan around that time, they wanted something to kind of put over, yep. I guess. I don't yep. know. But regardless, it led to him going to the Wrestle One and then all this. My first memory, I know he had like a little run in New Japan too. Uh, if you look at his cage match, like literally the second highest rated match is him versus Brock Lesnar in, in his New Japan run. That, <laughs> and, I, and Brock's New Japan run was not like highly regarded by by too many people, to be honest with you. He remember he named the F five the verdict yes. in New Japan yes. based on his court winning, <laughs> like, like beating <laughs> WWE in court. But it wasn't well received for the most part. But his match was rated very high on there. Uh, I definitely watched that match. It didn't really grab me, uh, but it was so long ago. Maybe, maybe if I watched it again, I would like it more, to be honest. Uh, but my real first memory of him, and this is a, this is, brings me back to so many things at the time when this happened. My real introduction to Akebono in Japanese wrestling was him and Yinling Sama. Yes. In Hustle, like Mistress Yinling, uh, one of the greatest wrestling characters of all time. Uh, in Hustle, where the, the infamous angle where Muto uh, sprayed her in s certain parts of her anatomy, <laughs> and that led to a baby angle. <laughs> she the, got the, pregnant from this. The giant egg. 
And then it turned out that Akibono was the baby. Yeah. Uh, a, a ridiculous storyline, certainly, which works with Hustle's whole aesthetic and all of that. But I remember that well, and he actually had a lot of matches. Not a lot, but he had a, f- a few matches in, in Hustle after that. Uh, so that that's really what my first exposure to Akibono, and I thought, this, this is nuts, but first of all. But he did everything as a freelancer. He was really everywhere. Uh, mm-hmm. But I think his most notable run was really what you pointed to. The All Japan run in the 2010s is kind of where I think of him in terms of his wrestling star. You know, that's when he was the champion, you know, winning the Triple Crown, winning the Champion Carnival. Yeah. Yeah. Like, that was when he had real success, so not just as a freelance attraction. Like, you know, oh, Akibono, legendary sumo guy. We're going to bring him in and do whatever we, we're going to do with him. And in, in all Japan, they actually did use him to a good extent. You know, I don't think he ever became, like, a great in-ring wrestler to me or anything like that. To somebody, I'd be like, oh, you could put him against anybody and it would be a great match. Yeah, but he he did grow into the way to where he was really good for him. Like if you put the right guy around him, he was good enough to where you could have good stuff with him. Uh, you know, and I think that they did a great job with that around the time. That was with the era of Kento was like very new in all Japan. Right. Go was still there. Kai was on the come up there. Uh, he had good matches with all those guys, uh, and obviously people like Suwama. I uh, was still a, a lot younger then, and they have some good beef matches. Uh, you mentioned Strong BJ. That was a great run in all Japan when they were there, and he was able to do good stuff there. So he, he did a lot of good stuff. He really found himself in the ring and became a, a really good performer for them and had a great role for them. And that is, you know, where I think lots of the ratings that we have on Cage Match actually fail, and it's key what you said. He became a really good wrestler for the statue that he had and for the traction that he was able to get, right? So my rating was a six out of 10 for him because of what he was able to do. But lots of, we have lots of early ratings from 2011, 2008. That's zero or one or two. And that really doesn't do him any justice because he really developed into being a, a formidable professional wrestler. And uh, the craziest part of his career probably was that he actually spent some time in Dragon Gate between 2008 and 2010, <laughs> yep. where he won the Open the uh, Triangle Gate Championship with um, Don Fuji and Masaki Mochitsuki, and also had a match for the Open the Dream Gate Championship against champion Naoki Doi at Dead or Alive 2000. Nine, and I'm just looking at the match. It was 15 minutes long, and it was. I recently saw a clip on Twitter uh, from that match, and it, it re- basically comes down to Naoki Doi doing dozens and dozens of Bakatara sliding kicks to Akebono to get the giant down, um, just to find attraction for. And that, at that point in time, he still still was the attraction. But like you said, he became part of the pro wrestling crew in 2014 and now yes yeah, sa- sadly akibono is not longer with us yeah yeah that is, that is a shame like you said i look at his career his last match being against takiyama and then right before takiyama's uh, tragic injury um i know his family were kind of private about mm. his, his uh, health issues they kind of tried to deny it when he first like got hospitalized in 2018 but then they kind of admitted that it was uh, a hard issue and very serious. Uh, like you said, the Odo thing didn't really have legs. I remember when it started, but it, like you said, it never really grew to anything. And he had a lot of health issues back then, six years ago. Uh, and he did was able to last for a long time, you know, relatively speaking, well, you know, six years after, you know, but he did a lot. Like he was all over the place as a freelancer. Like you said, even Dragon Gate, he did a lot in like Michinoku Pro. He was in Zero One with all the stuff. He had had like a feud with Onita <laughs> at one point. He did a lot of stuff in wrestling. And I think that for a guy whose run was like relatively brief, you know, like within it, you know, uh, if you total up everything, he was in there for around maybe a decade mm-hmm. and really only like really only a few years, like less than a decade in terms of like full time. He made a good impact on everything. He did a lot of different things, like wrestled in all the major companies, you know, and, and was able to utilize his stardom in a good way to keep his life in a good spot and keep his star in a good spot in Japan. So you have to really praise him for that. But, you know, always got a lot of respect for the big guy. Uh, everybody talks fondly of him pretty much. 
and I think he, uh, you know, really added a lot to the wrestling game, especially, at, uh, you know, again, all Japan is really where I personally think of him when I think of Akebono as a, as a wrestler. So a big loss there, but I do have to say rest in peace to him, and hopefully all of his friends and family uh, can find peace, and they're all in my prayers right now. Excellent. Yes, that is Akebono. So his life came to an end, Dylan, and that's always a an eternal circle of life ending and life beginning. And that's where I want to make the transition to my Yoshi topics that I have aligned here because Ibuki Hoshi recently said that she's pregnant and therefore she dropped the Ice X Infinity Championship. Of course, congratulations to Ibuki Hoshi. And I think... When her mom was pregnant with Ibuki, it was at a similar young age, uh, like Ibuki is now. So she's going to be, of course, out for a while. And so the title was vacated. And there's going to be a league tournament to determine the new champion starting on April 28, running through June 23rd with uh, two blocks. The first block is her mom, Hamuku Hoshi. We have Yumi, Misa Kagura, Kao Matsushita, and Arisa Shinose. And in block B, it's uh, Totoro Zatsuki, Yapi, Yuri, Sakuran, and Asuka Fujitaki. Yeah, that's the tournament that we have. Yeah, we had some... Um, well, of course, Ibuki being pregnant is, of course, good news for her, but it's bad news definitely for the company because, once again, they're losing one of the key figures to their to their company, and I think that Matsushita is also injured and out for a while, so we'll have to see how that develops. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's the that's the news that we have about the Ice Ribbon Tournament. Good news definitely is that uh, Tsukasa Fujimoto, she's returning to Ice Ribbon on 421 for a match uh, where she's teaming with Sari. So that's good news, but overall, Dylan, the the state of Ice Ribbon in, in the last couple of years, ever since the prominence breakup, they found some sort of success at a, at a small level with Ibuki Hoshi as champion and developing some new talent, definitely. But it seems like that there is a lot of setbacks for this company in recent years. Uh, that's putting it lightly, <laughs> I would say. Um, there's so much that's happened over, over the last years. I remember so much. Never mind when I, you know, it's it's well known that they were really one of my OG companies in the Japanese landscape. I've told the story before. Watched on you stream like they had a free show, nineteen o'clock for wrestling. But even on in the history of the Eastern Lariat, I remember us talking in the, our early years. But they were really at their kind of peak peak level. You know, two thousand sixteen, seventeen, mm. eighteen. Uh, they were having like show of the year level stuff. Uh, you know, I remember Risa Sarah as champion arguing to people that she was actually good as, as champion and everyone else was trying to say she wasn't. But uh, if you look at her drawing record, she obviously was a great champion. Yuki was on the way. You know, even then, though, the history of the company has, is rife with changes, dramatic things happening, troubles and, and things like that. But really, the, like I said, the whole history, like even back to the Emi Sakura days. Uh, you know, she had her exit from the company, and, you know, and everything that happened there that sent things into disarray. <laughs> you had big people leaving. Ashida, Miyako Matsumoto, I remember when they left, uh, you know, and it, it caused all this. And you had the stuff with Tsukushi's uh, incident, which was uh, really crazy uh, how that happened. Um, they were able to bounce back for, from all of that as well. Uh, then all the stuff happened with injuries. Uh, Julia leaving, like her contract, not just that she left recently, like to Noah <laughs> and, and everything going on, but uh, with the stardom release and everything um, that happened. I remember that was like Tequila Saya's retirement tour. Uh, there was a typhoon that messed everything up, and then she left, and it was like a. Like some people still never forgave Julia for that, uh, but it really hurt Ice for a minute at the time because they put so much into her as the next star. Uh, they continued on, they put so much into Suzu as the next star. Then Providence had to leave. <laughs> and so uh, that happened. Uh, Tsukasa, she got married and pregnant as well. Uh, so she was really like the ace of the company, like Fujimoto. And I remember she won the Tokyo Sports Awards, you know, in the past for the Joshi uh, competitor. Sakushi was their top star as well. She retired with the belt, uh, you know, at the time. And a very dramatic and emotional uh, leaving, too. A very, very wonderful exit strategy for her. 
Uh, but all of these people, these top stars, it's like constantly the top stars will leave for some reason. But in the world of Joshi, you know, you never can tell what's going to happen a lot of the times. Uh, you know, stardom is kind of an anomaly, like in the history of Joshi, like for a long extent that's, where there's so much. Correct. Yeah, where there's so much stability, like with them. And even they went through all this stuff like early on, like the first few years, it wasn't like that. But obviously with Bushi Road, like buying them, like they have a lot more stability now, even though it's getting tested uh, with this Rossi thing, I will, you know, so like they were really an anomaly. A lot of times in the Joshi history, there are people leaving for all sorts of reasons, <laughs> like throughout throughout the years, even dating back to all Japan women's, uh, there were crazy things going on. But Ice Ribbon in particular have had a really tough few years. <laughs> they had that period where the president was, like, rallying people up. Uh, nobody was happy. Uh, there were people coming out, uh, you know, like, and saying that, um, you know, like, he didn't know what he was doing, like, literally at the press conference, <laughs> pretty much, that, that they were leaving at. There were a lot of internal issues backstage. They've done it. If you really look at what they've done, because there was a new ownership team that took over recently, like, a couple of months ago, and they worked to make a lot of good changes. Uh, you saw some things going forward. Uh, you saw uh, the return of Kaho Matsushita in the first place after she retired at one point. Uh, and Same for Yuki Mashiro, actually. Yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah, her too. The Gacha King came back. And so you saw these returns. Things were going good. And now things are like, just more injuries and more bad stuff, but they're in a better place now than they were, like, you know, I'd say six months to a year ago. I, mm. I would say that they're definitely doing better. I don't know how, for any indie Joshi company we're going to talk about, it's kind of a tough landscape right now, like, with how things are, just a, the economy, things going on. It's not the healthiest scene at the moment. A lot of the companies are really struggling, and they're definitely one of them. But I think that there's a, there was at least a lot of hope coming into this year. We'll see if they could turn it into anything. This tournament is a decent way to start. Obviously, you don't want to lose uh, Hoshi, who they put, who's been around, like been a great rookie for years, and she was finally able to elevate herself, or they elevated her more accurately to the title. And I now think she's... Both, both sides really elevated each each other. I think the company elevated her to the level, and she really was able to run with the ball. And the thing with her is that if you saw her over the years, she's been around for years now, you knew she had what it takes. Like, she mm. was always one of the like the top wrestling talents of the company. Uh, and she to, for her to get the belt was a big thing. And like you said, she definitely did a great job with it. Uh, you know, did, did the best she could, but I've always respected her as a wrestler. Uh, I kind of wish that they were able to have a little bit more title defenses. You know, I mean, she won it in August of last year and had, like, three defenses. And the last one was last, you know, like, last month. So I, if, they, if they had really got the, the belt in order, but that's when things were really dysfunctional, like when she won the title. And through her title reign, they actually got a little bit more solid ground uh, through it. Uh, they did the thing with uh, Matsushita uh, in the Ribbon Mania. And it was still not that big, actually, even for their biggest show of the year. It was, like, 500 fans or something. Uh, for that, I don't have the numbers right in front of me. Yeah, see, 503. I looked at it here. Uh, it wasn't that big, but they were trying to improve and get there, and I thought they were building something healthy. Like, if they were, do if they were doing everything right now, like a year from now, you'll see some good changes to where they take steps forward. But obviously, the pandemic came as well. That affected every company. Uh, again, I still remember when we were talking about them in that era I was talking about with Risa Sarah as champion – where they were like, oh, like they were beating Stardom on most of their shows, <laughs> like you know, like they were outdrawing them, and uh, like they just didn't run as many as they did, but they had greater strength of popularity. Uh, Suka coming back, big gain for them. I think that's excellent news. Uh, it's it's a bummer. I mean, you know, the thing is with Ibuki, it's not like she had this tragic leaving, like so many other people, or like dysfunction, like you know, something like that. She got pregnant, which is yes. not, you know, that's a great thing for her Absolutely. and her life, you know. And so, first of all, I do want to say congratulations to Ibuki uh, for doing that. I hope her family is blessed and they have a great time, great, you know, great new life for this world. And hopefully she can come back. 
you know, in the Joshi scene, we've seen it before too. The overall tides have changed a little bit. They're still not like super fully there, but you've seen, and we've all seen in the past, where a lot of times, you know, like, for example, somebody who I was a huge fan of, uh, Ohata, uh, in Avid Rival, like mm-hmm. in Wave, we're going to talk a little bit about, she retired just because she got married, uh, pretty much, on there. Yeah. Or e- even Mio. Mio like, yeah, it was just yeah. Mio Shirai, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. They both retired. They they both married wrestlers, <laughs> too, too, <laughs> in those cases. Uh, but th- th- you'd think that would make it even easier. But the the cultural circumstance made it not easy. Uh, and things that we can't really fully understand, I, I don't think being not Japanese, as, as I always say. But it seems like the tides are turning a little bit to where this won't be her, the end of her career, per se. She will be gone for a while. And Suka also left because she was pregnant originally, and she's bouncing back. I yep. can't wait to see her, uh, what she brings to the table, because everyone knows she was one of the best, uh, for sure, for a long time. And her, and I love to see, at the same time, too, not necessarily in Ice Room, but in Seed Ring, uh, Arisa Nakajima coming back from, from her thing. And uh, that, that's great news. So you get both of the best friends coming back in at the same time. I think it could be a great thing for Ice Ribbon and uh, Seedling and all of the Joshi companies that they can work because they were, uh, they had like a great run at one point working in every company almost uh, as a tag team. So great to see Suka back. The tournament. Uh, hopefully they can bounce back from Kaho's injury, which I think that she would have been the, the mm, one to the yes. win. You know, they've got Yuri in there, like, you know, for it. You've got some names in there. They're trying to build people up. But a lot of these girls are very young, you mm-hmm. know, and, and not, not superstars, to say the least. So hopefully they can bounce back and have a great run with the tournament. But it, it gives you something to look forward to. I always say tournaments are like the easiest way to jump into a promotion if you're a new fan because you see everybody – they all get to show off their styles and what they bring to the table. This group, I'm not going to lie to you, like this roster now is not what it was, you know, a decade ago, like in terms of pure talent. That's just not accurate. But they do have a lot of people with promise. The training grounds are still very good there to where they can bring out a lot of, a lot of young talent. I mean, even who we were talking about, like, you know, Gotcha King and, and Matsushita, these girls haven't been around forever. Like, you know, like it's been a, a pretty brief run. Like, Matsushita's only like, what, two, three years into her career? And she's at a really. Top. Yeah, 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 at, at best, you know, exactly. Yeah. And, and she's very talented if you, if you look at her. And they all have great, unique personalities, too. Like I said, the Gotcha King, Mugadai Girl. Oh, they they, they do in 2021, actually. Okay, so yeah, yeah, see, I'm one of, yeah, exactly what I said yeah, on there. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, so good. Uh, but still, that's still not that long, <laughs> ultimately. So, but in that time, she's grown into a really good worker. Uh, you know, and like I said, all of the Ice Ribbon girls have a great personality. They work hard on that. And they have a chance to do something here. But I think what they really needed was somebody like Suka that is a big star that you could kind of bounce her off of these other talents and bring the best out of them and maybe bring more fans in. We'll see how it works. Again, the scene overall, you can't blame one person or one thing or one company. The scene overall is at a very lean period right now. Yeah. So let's keep that in mind uh, when we analyze these companies. Absolutely. Let's let's keep that in mind for um, the next one that I have because I thought we can also talk about this tournament. Then the Catch the Wave tournament is running simultaneously for a long part of it to the Ice Ribbon title tournament. Catch the Wave is starting on May 5 until July 14. And it's an, it's a very interesting roster of, of wrestlers they announced for that tournament. Of course, the home talent of Yuki Miyazaki, Sakura Yota, Kohaku, Kisuna Tanaka, who is extremely good at the level that she's uh, she's at with I like one year of experience, of course, the daughter of Minoru Tanaka and Jumi Fukukawa. Uh, then, of course, Honaka, Kaori Yoneyama, Cherry is coming in as a freelancer, Itsuki Aoki, also freelancer, uh, lots of times for Wave, of course, too. Two from uh, Colors, it's Saki, she's always in every tournament, basically. Uh, Yuku Sakurai, we have from Prominence, uh, Risa Sera, Kakiro Sekiguchi is there, Haruka Umasaki from Diana, Tai Honma, and where it got really loud when they made the announcement in 
Shinjuku face is that there are two wrestlers from stardom coming into this tournament in uh, Rana Yagami and Saya Kamitani. And that's a real big name for a tournament like Catch the yeah. Wave. Yeah, like you said, I mean, that was that had to be a shocker to, to see uh, Tall Saya in this. That's one of their most promoted stars. It's not, I mean, y- Yagami is like very new, like, you know, a rookie. So it kind of makes sense for her if they were going to do something like this. And they worked with Wave last year, too, Stardom did. They had a Starlight Kid there uh, for that. But, yeah, Tall Saya being in, that's a huge deal uh, for the company. That's a great get for them, for sure. I think that these – and you also have to remember, too, if you are a fan or somebody who maybe doesn't pay attention to Wave, the Catch the Wave tournament, if, you th- if you're the type of person that complains about the G1 having four blocks <laughs> – don't watch this show because <laughs> this tournament is nuts. <laughs> like if you think about it, there's always like every year there's like crazy block, queen block, youth block. It's, and this year they've got like uh, they've got the youth block, uh, they've got a uh, lucha block, and Elizabeth block. They they got the lucha block. Wow. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Great stuff. And Elizabeth oh, block. Fans. Yeah, you know, he's got Lucha Blog, but not <laughs> maybe Lucha Block uh, uh, there. But uh, yeah, uh, and all these other blocks. There's six blocks in the tournament. Uh, so I uh, keep that in mind. But it's always a bunch of fun, to be honest with you. Uh, they always have a lot of good stuff there overall. Wave has a lot of great young talent, too. Kizuna always gets the reaction from people. But just because of the name value, like everyone knows Minoru Tanaka. Mm-hmm. Fukawa wasn't a big star, but it's just cool that she's the daughter of two wrestlers, like pretty much. But I actually think Kohaku is like as good, if not better. Like she never kind of gets her flowers. She's been around for a little while, but she's still very young, like in her early twenties. Uh, she started at Marvelous and was a great wrestler there. Uh, I, I wish that they would really do something with her. Like if it were up to me, like I wish that she would win. I don't know if they're gonna do that, but. Uh, Two great young talents to build around. You get a lot of the the outsiders coming in to do some fun stuff. And Tall Saya, that's a huge name. Again, kind of like what we talked about with Suka coming into Ice Ribbon. You always need that one person who's like a hook for the tournament. And, and this is the biggest name they've had in a long time. Wave's another company. I remember when they were doing some good things, uh, they were never like the top-tier Joshi company. But I do remember when they had, you know, people like Arena Yamashita was, like, the ace for a while there. Mizunami, like I said, you know, Ohara I mentioned. They had a lot of great talent, and, and they were doing some big things. Uh, they went through a lot of changes, uh, roster reshufflings and things like that. Sakura Hirota, the, 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 the legend of Wave, always there through every era. And obviously a great comedic wrestler who I love watching very much, uh, obviously. Uh, that they have a lot of different people, and it's a good good vibe here. This tournament here, I don't know what they're going to do with the blocks, but to have Saya Kamatani that made some waves, no pun intended, and I think that it'll lead to a great tournament. It's hard to imagine Kamatani not winning. Yeah, <laughs> they 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 usually do a three way you know stuff yeah. too, like to end it. So they'll have somebody somebody else can lose if they want someone else to win. Mm, exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I think that's going to be going to be the end game of that. Has to be Saya Kapitani at the finals. Yeah. Yeah, yes. that's why I do a triple threat t- type of deal. Like they always do that when you catch the wave. So you could have somebody like if you don't want Saya to win, you could have, you know, Saki and Kohaku in the finals. So like I said, because Saki all caps yeah. must sure. always be sure. <laughs> in, in every <laughs> every scene possible in Joshi. Saki all caps will not <laughs> be left out of. Uh, but you could have like Saki pin Kohaku, for example. And I'm, saying, I'm not saying that's going to happen. That's just two random names <laughs> I picked out. Uh, and you could leave Saya out of the final, like the final decision. If you if you don't want her, or maybe they just want her to win. Like <laughs> that'll be fine. If they, you know, I don't think they would argue that. Yes, so let's catch the wave. Uh, one more topic, one more promotion that I have on my list is Sendai Girls. Now that Wrestle Universe has added more promotions, we actually get to see Sendai Girls. Uh, apparently more, and it's, it has only been one show so far that's been uploaded. But that show, I think it's really recommendable. I think it's a great Showing for the roster, for you too, as a, fa- as a fan, if you're new to Sendai Girls, you will get to see everybody that 
uh, is part of the roster, and the roster is not very big. Putting that very mildly, there is a lot of, not a lot of talent on the roster that's bound to Sendai Girls themselves. They also, much like Wave, they use a lot of independent talent or talent from other promotions. For example, on this show that is uploaded on Wrestling Universe on from uh, March 17, we have Mio Momono from Marvelous coming in. Venny is always a freelancer they use. On this show, we had also Nanae Takahashi who was teaming with the Zones from Evolution. Zones recently won their Young um, young Wrestlers Tournament. And, uh, yeah, of course, Hiroyo Matsumoto, long-standing freelancer that's been part of the company for a long, long time. So the best match on this show on the March 17 is, in my opinion, the second match, Miyamono and Yurika, Yurika Oka against Venny and Yura Suzuki. Great, great match there, but also the main event. Manami and Ryo Mitsunami defeating the Rare Ultimate Powers, Dash Shizako and Hiroyo Matsumoto was a very good match. So that's, uh, that's a show that you can easily pick up from uh, Wrestle Universe and they have also once again started to upload stuff on their YouTube. That's the YouTube channel of Senda Girls. It's, it's really a tragedy because there is so <laughs> many great stuff that you, that you would expect them to upload, but they just don't. <laughs> For some reason, there's so many cool matches that they do when they go to their Sendai shows and even other um, uh, shows in Osaka, for example, but then just never upload anything from that. And just this past weekend, the stars aligned, Dylan, all the stars aligned and they finally uh, had a new upload from the uh, Shinjuku Face show on January 7 and... People immediately jumped at the main event of that show because it was Shiro Hashimoto and Mika Iwata, the Sender Girls singles champion right now, against Mio Mono and Sari, and that was a kick-ass great main event. 20 minutes just all over the place, and that's some of the, the, the charm that Sender Girls really has. With that thin roster they have, you always get to see the interpromotional rivalries between Sender Girls and other groups, and that is... That always adds a little spice to the matches that we have. Even in the Yaya Uma tournament, the Young Wrestlers tournament with the zones going over Yura Suzuki, you saw that. And uh, yeah, uh, that that match really was cool. Oh yeah, I definitely watched the tag match. Uh, you know, just to look at the names alone, you know it's going to be great. Uh, you've got Hashimoto Iwata representing the company, obviously. Uh, that beauty bear energy uh, they, they they bring back here, uh, back in the old days, like when, when they were still younger. Momono, great wrestler, everyone loves her. And Sari has done huge things. Uh, pretty much ever since she returned to the Japanese scene, she's done a great job uh, in and out and everywhere else in the company. So, uh, yeah, great match. Uh, definitely worth watching. In terms of the YouTube, it's nice that Dash finally found the password uh, for the <laughs> things again to finally upload things and. I look forward to that continuing. Also worth mentioning that this upload, they uploaded a show that took place long before the Wrestle Universe upload in March that they had as well, but it debuted after, or it released after. So you could tell again, uh, these are smaller companies, uh, with Sendai Girls especially, mm-hmm. um, you know, essentially a mom and pop operation at, the, at this point yeah. uh, here going in there. But uh, the rest of the universe, that whole show was good. Like, like everything about it was good. Like all five matches, I thought delivered uh, well, well enough. Uh, it was worth. It really was worth a watch. Uh, to be honest with you, you know, like I, I thought you get a look at everybody. You had like an Iwata and like Kawahata match, uh, which was really good. The whole show oh, yeah. was good. Oh yeah, that that was really good too. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the whole, like all five matches, like delivered. Uh, even like uh, Maria and, and Yuna, all caps, uh, delivered pretty good there for a rookie level match. So you get a lot of cool stuff. Uh, like you said, the thing with Sendai is the same of like every company, pretty much like every Joshi company at this level is the actual like wearing the badge, contract, whatever members of the roster is not that many. But they have actually replenished. They've got a couple of different people in there, like with Yuna, uh, Marumori, uh coming Yuga in there. Suzuki. Yeah. Uh, so they've got some people coming in, but like any company you look at, like Seedling or whatever, it's going to be a low amount of people uh, just because of the way the scene is right now. Yes. But thankfully there's a lot of freelancers that are around to to that they could throw in and move in and d- do different things with. So you get a good show. 
their shows are always good. It's just a matter of they, like you said, will they upload it or not is the big question with Sendai. And if they do check it out and if they do a show on Russell universe, which hopefully they do continue that. And we see that in months to come and they have a show every month, at least check them out. I think you'll see some good wrestling up and down. Mika Iwata was finally able to overcome Venny. Uh, they did a weird deal in Venny slash Asuka's first title run. She defeated Mika Iwata and then dropped the title to Millie McKenzie. And Millie would then drop the title to Mika Iwata. And it seemed like that, I don't know, Venny wanted to avoid losing to Mika Iwata, it seemed like. But now she came in for the main event of Kirken Hall. Just on the 14th, just this past Sunday, the card that I've not seen yet, so Mika Iwata got the win over Venny. We also had Dashi Zaku versus Unagi Sayaka in a turn, in a, in a hardcore match, of course. Sari defeated Yurika Oka. So that's looking like a real good card that I want to check out eventually. A big news of the show is that Jordi Grace was announced as an opponent for Shihiro Hashimoto for the July Kirken Hall show. So that should be another big, big match there. What a year for Jordan Grace, uh, starting out at the Royal Rumble and now here at the Sendai Girls, working all over the place, TNA, getting some love all over the world. And, uh, I mean, if you look at them stylistically, this is a pretty great matchup. <laughs> like, like Grace and, and uh, Hashimoto, like the most powerful girls going at it, I think it's a great matchup stylistically. Again, if you just look at them, I think it's a natural pairing. I don't know how this started or who started this or whatever uh, or who led to this happening, but it's a really cool match, and I think it's nice for everybody involved and really great. Again, I don't know how it happened, but whoever made that call, <laughs> good, good work on the Sydney good. Girls part. Yes. So uh, one more Yoshi topic. This past Saturday, we saw the final match in Juria Nagano's career in Tokyo. Yoshi Pro Wrestling from Kita Sawa Town Hall. They started the show with Juria and they ended the show with Juria and always, and, and in these two matches, she also had Moka Miyamoto by her side. I think they started at a similar, uh, similar point in time in their careers. Moka de debuted in 2020, Juria in 2022. Definitely not at the same point in time, but they are definitely very good friends. You can see that inside the ring. Uh, and then this first tag match, six-man tag, was Juria Nagano, Kaya Toribami, and Moka Miyamoto against Poma Rajuku, Shino Suzuki, and Yuki Aino. Some focus here on the young talent Shino Suzuki in that match. That was good. And in the main event match, Moka Miyamoto got the win over Juria Nagano in a decent match. Juria... She announced a couple of months ago that she was leaving pro wrestling. She always has nice kicks around her. It's not like that she's, she improved a lot in the last year or so because she's just doing other ventures and it's good for her that she found the point to leave pro wrestling now. She got an emotional retirement ceremony at this show. So that was, was really touching. And from the wrestling standpoint, the best match of the show was semi main event. Shoko Nakajima, Wakana Uehara, and Himawari defeated Daisy Monkey, Ariso Endo, and Suzume, as well as the Princess of Princess champion, Mio Watanabe. And Shoko pulled the upset over Mio Watanabe and challenged her after the match. And another challenge was laid out by Himawari and Wakana Uehara to Daisy Monkey for the Princess Tag Team title. So a well built up two title matches for the next uh, big show for TGPW. Yeah, you know, Juria, she started out already good uh you know and, and I, I was really impressed with mm -hmm. her early on i thought that she really looked like if she wanted to be she could be up there and be one of the top wrestlers on the roster um like you said she had a lot of stuff going on and i don't think her heart was really in this ultimately yeah. and, and uh, i know it wasn't because that's why she definitely retired. not in the <laughs> last last year or so but uh, yeah. you're right when when she started out i really thought that she would eventually be the one to be the succession for uh, Mio yamashita yeah, just with the style, you know, yeah, like I could totally see that, uh, you know, going in there that you would want that. And she was great uh, at it early on. Like I said, uh, she was still really one of the more exciting talents when she did wrestle. It just wasn't a lot, uh, you know, overall. Like I said, her heart just wasn't in it anymore. And I think when we talked about this originally, I, I said something to this effect, but I think it's better if your heart's not in it to just leave than to not to like half-ass it, kind of, you know. 
like just like put it in halfway. You got all this other stuff going on. Like you're wrestling part time in your mind, but you're actually more worried about this other stuff. It's a hard thing, you know, uh, overall. So I think that I never got the sense from Juria that, you know, she was wanting to be anything more than she was ultimately. And she was still really good. Like I said, I think on the roster, she was one of the more exciting young talents. Um, Miyamoto, I've obviously always been a big supporter of and thought they were good as well. So I think that they were good wrestlers. Uh, just the problem is that if she had put her full self into wrestling, she could have been great, but she's got more important things for her to worry about. So you can't be mad at it. Exactly. And if you're a fan of Yoshi wrestling, you've said it before with Ice Ribbon 2 Dylan. These things tend to happen. There is a super rookie coming in that will blow everybody away and uh, shows great signs of having the potential to be a top star. But something will happen in their lives. They will find something else that they love, find someone else that they love, and they will retire from pro wrestling. That's the natural circle in, in Yoshi. And she was already famous anyway before Tokyo Joshi Girl. Right. So yeah. it's like it's even more it's like it's not even the same as that other stuff. Like she already had this other stuff that she was more known for. It was an attempt by Tokyo Joshi Pro, which they always do to get mm-hmm. people like this. And they're doing it still. Like you know, like we saw it at the uh Grand Princess show where they brought in the the you know, the idol that like that they brought in earlier. Yep. So it's like they're that's something they always do, and they are going to do it again, and that's what they're about. Like, that's what the company is, and, you know, of the of the people they brought in, like, the idols they brought in of the wrestlers, she was the best one by far, <laughs> like, to, to me, like, jury, like, compared to a lot of these other ones that they bring in. Uh, so it's a, kind of a shame on that level, but I can't be mad at it. Uh, like I said, she was already popular for her TikTok and all that stuff. So it's fine. It's a loss to the company somewhat, but it's not like they ever really pushed her – like they, they, I think they knew the school, like pretty much. Like you know, after a while, they had a little bit of a tag run with her and, and Mocha, uh, you know, and that's about as far as it went. Yes. Ultimately, so it, it's not a, a huge loss because they never really, it never even got far enough to be a, a big loss. But it is a loss in that she's very talent. She was very talented. Uh, but we'll see where they go from here. You know, hopefully Mocha can get something from this, being a part of the, the last match. And oh, she's I good. Think she's, yeah, she's really talented. I've always said that. Uh, so I, they were a good tag team. So hopefully Mocha can get something from it and they can push people. You know how it goes in Tokyo Joshi Pro. It can be very slow moving for young wrestlers to move up the card, but hopefully this can give her a little bit of a springboard. Exactly, yes. One more Wrestle Universe note. Noah had another Kirkenhall show. Definitely didn't reach the heights of the last one that we discussed here. We had an atrocious match for the national title. Dylan uh, Hayata, he did it. You wanted this to happen, and it eventually did. That's Hayata. not true at all. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is true. You always are a big fan of Hayata, and you wanted this to happen. Hayata is the new national champion. What are you doing? What Twilight Zone have you walked out of? <laughs> this is like I said, what are you drinking in that bottle over there is what I want to know. I think the truth right here. Like I said, I, I, do, I do not uh, think you've listened to this show uh, very, very well over the last <laughs> few years o- overall, if that's your opinion. But I knew it. I already prepared. It's just like we talked about. Remember the tournament? You told me they wouldn't exactly, push Hayata yeah. in the best. No, no, no. I, I didn't. I didn't say that. I didn't say that outright. I'm just questioning because he's from Pro Wrestling Noah. If if they want to give him any any uh, any wins there, but oh, you well. said you made a great point of Hayata being their most protected, protected guy, and we saw that here. And like I said, they're not going to job out the national champion to junior heavyweights. <laughs> like that, that's not going to happen. Like it's even. So funny. Uh, it's, it's it's a terrible world we've lived in that this is the the result that they've lived in and I'm telling you like he is going to be a major player in that tournament I'm, I'm I'm preparing myself mentally just like this title reign I knew he was gonna win because they weren't gonna have Jack's not gonna be double champion forever like his title reigns haven't been very good like both to be perfectly honest with you uh, this double champion run hasn't really done anything for anybody no 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 so they had to get the belt off of him. Unfortunately, in their warped society they've created, Hayata is that best option of everyone. So many people on this roster you could look at, and you pick Hayata. It's That's just, what we it was, it was just a bad match. There was oh yeah, the match itself was not even good at all. No, no real heat to it. 
ridiculous overselling at some portions, cheating. The, the no, finish, the finish was. Who was the babyface? Who match? was the babyface in this this match? I have no clue. Ayala cheated to win the title, and in the end, from Morris, um, I don't know, man. That was not good. The best two matches of this show was uh, first the. Sema main with an eight-man tag match, Goshi Ozaki, Katsuki Fujita, Naomi Chimao, Fuji and Takashi, Sugiyura versus Eliol, der Dr. Wagner Jr., Jake Lee, Masaki Tamiya and Roy Oiwa. Great opportunity for Oiwa to work against guys like Fujita and Shiozaki here once again. Uh, well, that was good. Uh, and the main event match, that's the match that I loved the most from this show. It was incredible to see Kaito Kiyomiya come into this match and just storm and bruise through Keno here, he just whipped his ass in the first couple of minutes of the show, and Keno brought this all up on, up on, uh, onto himself, selling shirts of baby Kaito, uh, mm-hmm. image of baby Kaito on these shirts, and Kaito Kiyomiya was just so mad at him. Keno was able to land some offense in the middle portion of the match, but in the end, it was a very dominant victory for Kaito Kiyomiya, something we haven't seen in Pro Wrestling no, for a long time. Yeah, um, the semi-main event I thought was all right. Uh, I definitely thought the best part of the match was when Go was in. Him and Oiwa had some great chemistry. Go and Wagner also did good. Uh, I think a lot of the other guys were kind of like not going full throttle uh, in, in that match, to be honest. But when Go was in, it was really good. Uh, the main event, I made an unfortunate mistake of watching their match from 2018 back before this. And that kind of put it in perspective, like, how, mm. like, not actually great this match was, uh, like, to me. Like, they, the the wrestling here was good. Like, you know that it's going to be good. And the yeah. stuff with the shirt was very funny. Like, uh, like, unquestionably a great promotional tactic. But you see him, and then it all comes down. Yes, it was a good win for Kaito. But the problem is, is he got there as Muto Jr., like doing it, and that's all yeah. I can kind of see when I watch him now. I know, I know, and and it, I don't like it actually. Like, I mean, and I'm not the only one here. Uh, if you look at every other Cork and Hall Noah has done this year, and compared to this one, this is by far the lowest one. Like 935 fans, yeah. not even a thousand for this match, and. One of those matches that did 1100 was like a junior tag title match. It was the main event on the show. So that kind of tells you this feud actually isn't that over in the grand scheme of things. And I think you got to really look at Kaito as just being an anti draw at this point on top. And they tell no, you he is. It's self who, who says that? President. Yeah, he tells you he's not a draw. Yeah. <laughs> Last year, President yeah. says that. So it's so it's a self fulfilling prophecy for for this for the company. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> like, there's no doubt that that's true uh, there. And I feel a little bad for Keno, like, being against him and doing this. And, again, the match was good. Like, when you watch the old match back, though, there's something there that just isn't he- here in this modern version. And I can't unsee it, kind of. So I-, I would say it would be good, like, three and a half, three and three quarter stars, whatever. Like, but I wouldn't say this is a great match. Like, and, and when you look at a lot of their history... I think they've had a lot of great matches between each other. But Kaito's so, fallen so far, and I just don't like the Muto act at all. It really takes all of his matches I, I, down I, for I me. Totally get that. And, and like I said, the fans are telling you this. When you have this low I, number... Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. And I'm not very far off with the Muto-isms. I really don't like them either. It's I've accepted it as part of Kaito Kiyomiya's deal. It was just a nice change of pace to have, to have him actually be in an important match and know and win that. But well, uh, you if you if you pull, yeah, yeah no if you pull pull the curtain back and think about what what is behind that, and uh, if you analyze it analyze it uh, deeper, then there is of course lots of issues with with him and Presley Noah. And you would hope that this is the, the start of moving in a better direction from him. Yeah, but, like, I, but I can't trust them with that. I just think it's too late. Like at, at this point, like even if they start doing things right, I think he needs. A complete revamp. Like he, he can't just be the complete, the same person he is right now. Like and be mm. successful at it. Like I don't, I don't think there's any way for that for this person that he is right now. I think he needs to change everything uh, about about him pretty much. 
and I go back to whatever drawing board they need. Because I just don't think there's a hope for this Uto cosplay person to be a top star, like at least a successful one. They don't really have a choice that he has to be put in these kind of positions, but I don't think he's very successful at it, unfortunately. And you know, Keno. Uh, you know, he was kind of wrapped up in this. I don't really blame him for anything too much or anything. And, and the work between the two is very good. Don't get me wrong. Uh, you know, obviously, the thing is, Kaito, if you talk about pure in-ring talent, he's one of the best, actually. Like, not just in Noah, but in any company to me. I just think, unfortunately, where he's at and what they have him doing just isn't a recipe, not just for success, but for also me thinking he's that great. <laughs> like, I'm liking him. Even in the tag team, you they put so much on Oiwa, and I think that's kind of not her, mm. affected, not helped his star power either. Uh, like, being, like, the second to a young guy, like a young lion. Um, but, yeah, the match was good. Like, worth watch, for sure. I don't think as good as their other matches that they've had in the past. But if you take all that out, if this is your first ever Kaito Keno, I'm sure you liked it a lot. But uh, you should watch the other ones, <laughs> too, I would oh, say. Well, maybe not, <laughs> if you want to enjoy this one. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that that's true as well. <laughs> but uh, I hope for the best. Like I said, you would hope that this is a step forward. I, I hope that they give Kaito some big changes going forward, though. That's more important to me than necessarily, uh, let's put him at the top of the card. Like, he needs to, ch- like, the, everything needs to change with him. And, you know, Keno... Uh, what's his future looking like? I don't know. <laughs> like I said, it's, a, it's a tough spot right now. And, and Noah, where else can he go at this point? Like, you know, he lost the title not that long ago. Uh, it, it, his YouTube page is very cool, like very successful. That's like, that's, that's nice. I just, I don't know where they go with him at this point. So they have a lot of questions <laughs> to, to answer uh, this company as usual, I would say. Another question, because they kind of brought the talk up themselves, is the future of Roy Oiwa. There's been some talk of people wanting him to remain with Pro Wrestling Noah. I just think <laughs> that's there's, just, there's just zero chance that's going to happen. No. <laughs> what? No. Why would he do that? I think uh, Mauro Fuji even brought it up on the show and said, why don't you just stay here? <laughs> and Oiwa was probably like, hey, because this other place is better? Well, let me tell you something. That other place needs someone like him. Exactly. Like, yeah. on, on top of it. Like, not just for him. When he goes, he's not going to be somebody who fades away into the background. He's going to be a guy for New Japan. That guy is so talented. Oiwa, uh, he's been a great part of these Noah shows. Uh, he really carries himself so well. He has something that you just can't teach, in addition to being a really talented in-ring guy, too. So when he goes to New Japan, like, this is going to be a guy that gets pushed He's going to be a guy that means something. Uh, he's got a great future ahead of him. Uh, Oil yes. was a really great talent. I just said it on Twitter. Eventually, when he eventually returns to New Japan Pro Wrestling, the program they need to really lay out well is Oiwa versus Yura Tsuji because that's where the money is at. Yeah, and, and, and absolutely. I think, well, you know, like they do have young guys, but he definitely should not be forgotten. Like he he's up there with Suji and these guys. He should be up there as one of the future stars yeah. of that company. So so great future for him. Uh, we, we'll see where it leads. But as long as he's in Noah, he's adding good things to the card. So I don't know how long that'll last, but uh, I do think that as long as he's here, he's doing great work uh, up and down. You think he's going to be in the in the G1 this year? I wonder, like I said, I could see them waiting, like holding off for that one more year, like, you know, maybe mm. give him, put him in the Noah tournament might be more, more likely yeah, for this year. Yeah. I don't think it's impossible he goes like to G1 though. I mean, he's ready. Like if they, if they wanted him to come in, I don't think he would be like, oh, him at G1, like that's really risky. Yeah, I mean, like guys like Tamatonga is, uh, are dropping out. Yeah, he's gone. There's, like, there's room, there's room for someone new. They need people. Uh, we kind of talked about this in the last one. Like we talked mm-hmm. when you talk about Nakajima. They need people. <laughs> like just, just period on, the, on that roster right now. And uh, he would be a great pick. I wouldn't write it off. I, I wouldn't say I'd like. Yeah, it's definitely going to happen. But I definitely think it's possible that he is in the G1. Yeah. More New Japan talk later. And one more topic here on Dragon Gate. Uh, they actually had a match that we both <laughs> unanimously loved, Dylan. Yeah. <laughs> the final once again, second year in a row that the final of the uh, Rey de Pereas really delivered. This one had natural vibes, Big Boss, Shimizu, 
and uh, strong machine J first in the semifinals, of course. Uh, they lost to Susumu Yukuska and Yamato uh, in the opener of the show. Then the second semifinal was Dragon Kid and Naoki Doi defeating Big Hug. Dragon Kid scored a win over Hio. We'll see when that will be brought up again because Hio is the open the Brave Gate champion. And in the finals of that tournament, Dragon Kid and Naoki Doi defeated Susumu Yukuska and Yamato in a match that, rated, that I rated 9 out of 10. I thought it was a great, great veterans match. was built incredibly well. The first minutes were spent uh, trying to keep down Dragon Kid, trying to take away all of his offense. Dragon Kid was was a key of this team of uh, with him and Naoki Doi, and he was also key to this this main event match. Uh, just great, great sequences to the eventual finish of the match. Uh, this was 22 minutes long. You will love this match if you watch it. Oh, this was a fantastic match. It's funny because it kind of plays into our conversation on the last episode we did uh, talking about the old rosters of DG and the, the high flyers, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Like, you see these four, these veterans, they're, like, even now, they're so smooth, like, together. Like, it's impossible to replicate, I feel, I feel like. Like, these guys from that era, they just work. It's like butter fit. Like, everybody just so works so well together. Uh, they're amazing. Um, you just have Sus- to look at the, yeah. at the world liner. The world liner yeah. is a move that Susumu Yukuska and Dragon Kid came up with for their Kobe World main event. I think it was in 2006. It might have been when Susumu was the Open the Dream Gate champion. Let me see. 2006. Yes, Kobe World 2006. It was it's the World Liner. The World Liner is a move that's basically a reversal to Dragon Kids, uh, Ultra Hurricane Rana, the Swan Dive yeah. Hurricane Rana, where they roll through into a kind of a sunset flip from Susumu. So that's. The smoothest transition to uh, to a hook and runner that you can see, and it's also a slick one, a really quick one. You have to really, really look at it to look at it multiple times to even understand what they're doing, and they are still doing it at this point in time. They are they are uh, how old is DK? He is forty eight, and Susumu is forty five years old, and they still are able to perform this move. And they did this in this match as well. Naoki Doi broke up the pinfall for a dragon kid and in the final in the finish of the of the match it was dk avoiding the world liner once again and uh, it's just part of their history it's part of the dna of these two and it will always be brought up when these two wrestle and it's just just incredible yeah absolutely i thought they i don't want to say stole the show because the other two were good too but that they were who i was going to mention like especially susumu i think this guy is just such a fantastic wrestler oh, and he's yeah. coming He's coming off his title shot last month, or uh, in March. Yeah, last month. And he was great in that match, like brought something out of uh, Monte, who we did, hadn't seen before in there. And then you see this, and he's just killing it. 48 years old, DK, it's nothing to these guys. Like, they're just wrestling great, and it's, like, easy for them. They make it look so good. Uh, again, DK, whatever his age, he does. the great thing about him, and his mask is, it it doesn't really show on him. Like, you know, he could be 10, 15, 20 years younger, and he wrestles the same, like, maybe not the same as, like, you know, that 2006 level, because his that level was so good, kind of like what we said in the last episode. There's nobody like him in the modern world gen- in general, but he's still so damn good at it. He would be one of my top picks for, like, the high-flying guys on the roster even now. And Susan is just one of the top wrestlers I- anywhere. This guy has a legacy, Susumu does, of just constant decades worth of amazing performances, great matches, hard hitting, being the base, whatever you need him to do, comedy gimmicks in the past. He's done everything. Uh, I just love Susumu and a great turnaround from last year where he was able to get Konda. Let's not forget that where yeah, their team, something nobody expected to have a big run. They got months and months out of that run off of that amazing final match that they had. And he is such a big part of it. Uh, so him and Yamato worked together here. Uh, Kid and Doi worked together. It was great. And uh, I think that they're 
this match is definitely worth a watch. Like, really cool match. The tournament itself, we kind of talked about it. Yeah. It wasn't that great, but the final definitely make time for this because this this was really good stuff. And Kid and Doi going after Kaito and Alejandro, that could be like a really cool match. Oh, uh, as, as well. oh, Naroki Doi, the the smack talker of smack talkers, he completely destroyed Kaito Kiyomiya on the mic, telling him, I, "I have no idea if you are any good as a wrestler, but you are the worst champion that we have ever had. So come here, bring your belt, and lose to us." Something like that. Well, his point was kind of justified. Yes, absolutely. Because he was mad that Kaito didn't. You know, if you look at them on Noah, he never wears the the open the twin. No, they've no. never defended the title since uh, January, since the first defense. Yeah. Yeah, and they don't even wear the belts, like let alone defend them. It's like it, like they might as well not be champions. So his yeah. point is like accurate overall. I don't know if there's some sort of legal like Wrestle Universe cannot show the the, <laughs> the, the, the Dragon Gate titles. Like I don't know. Like who knows what I the think, deal is? No, no, I don't think they would know. I think I don't think so. Well, it would be weird if they, yeah. that, that like if that was true, but I, I don't know what the reasons is. Like, why not just wear the belts? I don't know. <laughs> like overall, I guess they just like don't want to represent a lower ranked company in their, their eyes on the roster. Uh, but still, I just it's just weird. And do I put him on blast for it? He, 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 <laughs> yes, he he, he he had to put it down. And. uh Yes, absolutely, and I fully expect Naroki Doi and Dragon Kid to win the title because they're kind of putting putting steam behind these four, and this is going to be a match that will be looked back at in a couple of months because Yamato, after the main event, said, hey, why don't we just form a unit? And so this is kind of a unit... Great like, idea. ...like the veteran team was years ago. And yeah. yes, it's a, it's a great idea because we saw it here that these veterans are still the top of the card and uh, got the main event uh, got the main event to a level that the tournament was not able to perform at. And so and they need different like the unit shakeups that's another problem like you can talk about the talent on the roster but the unit situation has been a yeah. struggle for this company yes. for and it used to be like the highlight of Dragon Gate to me was like all the units the faction warfare blah 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 they've really lost a lot of that i would say in the modern era so let's get these guys a unit shake some things up do some things different i love that idea yes definitely so if you love the unit warfare dylan you should definitely watch the show from this past sunday the first definitely of the double shot in across Fukuoka. In the main event of that, we had a Captain Falls eight man tag elimination match, Zebrats against Natural Vibes. And this one, even in this, uh, yeah, rather small arena, we had 535 fans in attendance. This got a decent reaction out of the local crowd in Fukuoka because it was a really well booked match. We had uh, Shun Skywalker Kai, Jason Lee, and Ishin against KZ, Big Boss Shimizu, UT, and Jackie Fagi Kamai. And of course, Kamai once again was the focal point of that match. KZ got eliminated as the first one in this match because he was dragged out of the ring by someone. I think it was Jason Lee, who also, of course, was very important here. So over the top elimination. Then Lee eliminated Big Boss Shimizu with a low blow and a schoolboy. Then it turned out to be a big portion of the match for uh, Natural Vibes. They bounced back. Kamai el eliminated Kai. UT eliminated Ishin. Jackie Funky Kamai was eventually able to eliminate Shun Skywalker. And for the final pinfall, Jason Lee used his new knee strike to the face to defeat Jackie Funky Kamai. This one had a real good structure, real good vibe to it. And uh, it turned out to be a match that was important for the upcoming main event for Dead or Alive because KZ accepted the stipulation that if he loses in that cage match, he will leave Natural Vibes. So that makes Dead or Alive instantly much more interesting. Um, the evening portion of the double shot had... Shun Skywalker and Johnny Valletta against Luis Mante and Hio in the main event. Um, ten minutes, quick match. Uh, Valletta once again got a pinfall, defeated Hio. Skywalker and him beat up Hio after that, and Jackie Funky Kamai saved Hio. That comes off the Kirken Hall show, where Hio demanded to be put in the main event for Dead or Alive. And the Dead or Alive main event is a Mascara contra Caballera 
Cage Match, Five Way Match, KZ versus Jackie Funky Kamai versus Hio versus Shun Skywalker versus Jason Lee. So this is um, Dylan very interesting because we have different factions in this match. Of course, Natural Vibes and uh, Zebrats, but also Hio from Big Hug. And of course, Big Hug wanted to adopt Jackie Funky Kamai as their new member earlier this year. And Kamai, he chose to remain with Natural Vibes. And the story going on with Jason Lee here in this in this Zebrats group is that Lee eventually thought that joining Natural Vibes in the first place was a mistake. So the idea, of course, is that fans question where Jackie Fagi Kamai's loyalty lies in this match. I think this this was heated up really, really well in the last uh, yeah in the last week or so since uh, the end of the Red of Piraeus and the new Gate of Passion tour. There's different um, there's different options that are lying on the table for this main event. Um, I think <laughs> it's very likely that Casey is losing this match and has to leave his own creation because Natural Vibes has been on the deathbed for a couple of months now. And this one would be one of the final blows because in, realistically, without KZ, there is really no reason for Natural Vibes even existing. And then there is the question, what role Jackie Funky Cowboy will play in this match? Will he be the one? Will him and KZ be left as the last two in this match, for example, yeah, to, to be the ones remaining and to have to fight for for keeping their hair and will Jackie Fanky Kama be the one that puts KZ out of natural vibes that's the, that's one of the questions the loyalty of Jason Lee seems like definitely lies with Zebrat so that should be a situation that is not like Shun Skywalker and Diamante like in last year's cage match that should be different the question mark is also behind Hio Hio joined with Luis Monte as Big Hug last year. Mm, the tag team, I've said it on the last show, it's um, Luis Monte, he's, he's not really working very well as a champion. Sometimes he's overshadowed, not sometimes, a lot of times actually he's overshadowed by, by Hio, who, who is very popular with the crowd. So I, I figured, I thought about would they actually break them up again? That could be something that they would think about. But then again, Big Hack just got together a couple of months ago. So what do you think, Dylan? What is Hio's role going to be in this five-way match? Uh, I think it's like totally possible he loses only to set up like a Shun, like, you know, re revenge tour, like against Shun here, Shun to get the, the thing, get the hair from Hio. That could and also he, be. Especially because, like, you know, we're on the path towards Kobe world after this. Uh, they're going to have to figure out some kind of main event uh, for that. And uh, I don't think it will involve Gianni Valletta as, as the Dreamgate champion, who's challenging Luis Monte on this dead or alive show. The stuff with KZ kind of puts the focus back on him mm -hmm. uh, and, and the natural vibes is part two. Again, I think a good option would be for it because so much of this match was started by Jason's turn. I think it would be much better if Jason was the one that wrecked stuff like, you know, like after turning heel, uh, you can always put it on Shun again since it's kind of his thing, you yeah. know, like when it comes to these matches. But I actually think if it were me, I would have Jason uh, take the hair and, and break up natural vibes uh, with it and accomplish his goal, which would then lead to Jackie wanting to get revenge even more so, like heat that feud up even more, because I think that's a big match uh, for Kobe World, uh, Jackie and Jason uh, in and of itself. So uh, that's what I would do, uh, I think. Uh, totally down to break the unit up. It's tough because Vibes is like such an easy, like, unit. Like, you know, they're always over. Like, all you could always do, you know, have them in their spot, open the shows, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> like, you always get a good crowd reaction. But they went so far with this disarray with Strong Machine J, Jason turning. If you're going to go this far, you might as well just go yes. all the way yes. with, with it. So I would have KZ lose and have Jason be the one to, to beat him. And that would lead to either K – who knows? Like KZ, 
that would lead to some interesting possibilities as well for him if he was outside. Like, would he try to turn a heel afterwards, do something mm-hmm. totally different? Like, but I think the best the best option is that Jackie goes after Jason after that to get revenge for all the vibes, pretty yeah. much. Yeah, they're putting a lot of steam behind Jason Lee, and um, this was a very much needed turn for him. He was, like, treading water in uh, natural yeah. vibes. Much like, actually, lots of members of natural vibes are treading water in this stable and that's maybe part of that's the why reason we're breaking them up. <laughs> yeah why, why the stable has to go because when you look at the stable there there is you said, you said it about strong machine j there is big boss shimizu who of course yeah he had this title shot last year but he's for the most part not really doing anything ut is not doing anything jackie feki kamai is always on the losing end of the of the mat, multi-man matches so there is definitely room for some of these wrestlers to move up the car when Natural Vibes is no more. Uh, and Jason Lee is really really uh, doing a good job as a heel like that with Zebrats, even though it's questionable how he got there. That definitely is is something because initially he did not want to join Zebrats, but now he kind of is aligned with Shun Skywalker. So there's really yeah. a, there's lots of stories going into this match and there's the different outs but it seems very much likely that Casey is losing I like your idea about Hio losing I actually have not thought about that um, it's it's interesting that he's in this match that, that's, a, that's a complete yeah. different factor in comparison to that they have, would have just done a regular tag match with Vibes versus uh, Zebrats yeah that's a good point uh, you know when you think about it that he that, that's kind of what makes me not completely write off that he would lose instead of KZ. Uh, it seems like when they announced the, the like, I'll leave that for vibes, that kind of put more on him. Because at first I thought it would be Hio that would lose. I also think if they were smart, you could have... The thing is, it's tough because if you have Jason, like, take his hair, that would lead to a title match, surely. Like, you know, for the Brave Gate. And I do think there's... It would be better if you could... This could all lead somehow to Jackie taking the Brave Gate from Jason. So you could set that mm-hmm. up in this match, but do you want to have Hyo like double lose, like lose the hair and then lose the belt? Like, I don't think they would do that when he's he's nah. like, like you said, he is popular. You know, even though I'm I personally am not a big fan of his, but he is a popular guy on the roster. So I don't think they would do that. I think it makes much more sense for Casey to to lose than Hyo at this point. But like I said, I wouldn't be against it. You could set some stuff up. Uh, I think it would make more sense, though, even in that scenario, I think it would make more sense for Sh- for Jason to do that than Shun, just because with Shun, you can't, Hio can't really get revenge on, on Shun in that case, or like even attempt it, and you can't do anything with the belt, but maybe that would be a positive for that, like you could have him lose the hair, but he could get a win later for the belt, so he kind of evens it out, and then Monte goes after Shun for revenge, kind of like what I said at the start. So I do think that's an option for sure. It's interesting that we only have one mask wrestler in this match. <laughs> and that he's the least likely to lose. <laughs> 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 uh, I'm there. I think they're trying to make that his thing. Uh, that's why yeah. I could definitely see Shun be, being in the final. Like, it wouldn't surprise me if he was the one that took the hair or the mask or whatever, or the hair in this particular case. Because that's kind of his deal. Like, you know, so it, it kind of makes sense. It also makes sense with the Luis Monte story in the background. Yeah. That he defeats Hio then, yeah. It's, it's exactly. That's what. I, that's exactly what I was saying. Like that could set up a Kobe World mm. deal, or at least yeah. the first step. Yeah, that's that's definitely an intriguing match. Yeah. Third one besides the Twin Gate title match that we already talked about is Luis Monte defeating the Dream Gate title against Johnny Valera. They built that up through uh, a match in Kirken Hall where Valera pulled off Ultima Dragon's mask and Luis Monte is of course uh, yeah he's he sees Ultima Dragon as kind of a mentor so, sorts of that and he came to the ring confronted Valera and they agreed to a title match uh, I don't see this one going longer than 10 minutes because Valera is definitely not the guy to do a long <laughs> drawn out singles match he has these clear limitations. He's working actually pretty well, and they are mm-hmm. leading very much into his shtick. They added this siren that is going off before his theme starts to alert the crowd that that he's coming and going through the crowd. 
of course, uh, like Bruiser Brody would, or the tri tribute sticks that they always have in Japan would. And um, for that, he's working well. And that's a, that's a singles title match that you talked about a couple of months ago when we first talked about him. Him and Mante here um, should be a clear victory for Mante. Uh, but definitely something very different from usual Dreamgate matches. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And just something to put over Monte to beat this big guy. You know, like pretty much. Like it gives him something for the fans. It's not necessarily for, like, you know, like you said, it's not going to be this epic classic match or anything like that. But it's something different. It gives Monte a good win to make himself look better to the fans. So it makes perfect sense when you think about it. Yep, definitely does. Yeah, so that is Dead Our Life. That is Dragon Gate. Uh, well, let's pull the curtain back a little bit. Uh, we are doing the second part of the show one day later, one day after the first part. Initially, I wanted to do that because I was expecting the New Japan cards, and of course I knew about the Marigold announcement. But man, oh man, I did not expect that there was such a lot to discuss with this Marigold announcement. So, first of all, this is... The, of course, the new company of Rossi Ogawa. And the press conference was streamed on Wrestle Universe. So the, the obvious alliance between Rossi Ogawa, his wrestlers, and Wrestle Universe continues. There uh, was the announcement that the Marigold roster will involve Julia, Utami Hayashishita, Mirai, Mai Sakurai, Victoria Yuzuki as... Yuzuki is now called, and the two names that were not talked about yet are Nanae Takahashi and Nao Ishikawa. And on the first tour, there will also be the foreigners Myla Grace, Zeda Steele, and Bozilla. Bozilla, she's the daughter of German wrestling legend Ulf Hermann, and uh, is, I think, two years into her career, and I'm uh, yeah, really, really looking forward to what these can bring. And I've I've said it to a friend right here. I mean, she's very green still, but stardom used to have very green foreigners as well. And some of them, if you gave them half a year in their training facilities, they became better at a rapid pace. So looking forward to that. See, I bet you weren't expecting German representation. No, <laughs> it was not. But given <laughs> Given that she's the champion of Sirius Wrestling right now, and Sirius is a promotion that's led by uh, Jesse Gabbard, so the former alpha female, so um, I, I, I'm not as surprised because there is definitely still a connection between her and uh, Rossi Ogawa. Yep. And uh, yeah, so let's talk about this promotion. So uh, Rossi Ogawa will serve as the president. And Hachiro Zuki, who once ran the Yoshi promotion Ibuki, will serve as a director. And also returning to Rossi Ogawa is Fuka from Actress Girls. We'll talk about that in a bit. I looked up the meaning of Marigold. So there is a Japanese language to for uh, attributes for flowers. Uh, and that, that language is called Hana Kotoba. And the language is meant to convey emotion and communicate directly to the recipient or viewer without needing the use of words. The language of the marigold flower in Japanese, that's what is attributed to it, uh, the attributes for the marigold flower are brave, health, and unchanging love. And the flower's appearance, atmosphere, myth, and the legend have influenced this language of flowers. So that may be something that that they looked at when naming the promotion Marigold. So, Dylan, what is your first take on the first roster? And, of course, also on the first dates that they set. First, there will be a interpromotional match, if you want to call it that, at the Wrestle Magic show on May 4 in Sumo Hall. It will be 
Julia Utami Hayashita Mirai at Mai Sakurai against the Monday Magic Yoshi Rasta of Miyuki Takase, Sakuya, Nagisa Nosaki, and Takumi Iroha. And then Baby Show will be on May 20 in Kirken Hall with more shows. Going forward, May 26th in Shinkiba, two shows actually on that day. Then in June, we have Osaka, Hamamatsu, Kurokan Hall once again, Kyoto, Nagoya, Shinkiba again, Sendai, and that's the first schedule for the tour. They're looking for seven to nine dates per month, so more than we initially thought. Now, what's your, what's your initial take on this new project? Yeah, in terms of the dates and stuff, I was talking about this a bunch. I, I kind of got tipped off, actually, that that was going to start at the end of May. So I knew it was coming. Uh, you know, I alluded to it on our previous show uh, when we talked about this. I know they've got some pretty big plans, to be honest with you. Uh, you know, they're not at this trying to be a small-time organization. They're trying to be up there, maybe not overtake stardom, but at least be number two, you know, like pretty much at least be like that bridge company between the rest. Because the, a lot of the other companies, you know, you know, besides stardom and Tokyo Joshi Pro, because they've got that – huge backing with the companies behind them they're all kind of at a similar level and they want this to be a bigger one we'll see if it, how it plays out on that end uh we, i kind of spoke about it earlier the scene isn't the greatest it's been in, in general pretty much uh the stuff about the flowers is is very true uh that's it's very common uh knowledge i think like it's, it's like for example cherry blossoms are like you know the springtime uh, you know yeah, flower yeah. uh so, so it's very common Mary Gold, the name, like, let's start there right away. I think it's fine. Like, when you look at a lot of these other companies, uh, you know, you you had the seed ring, uh, you know, stuff like the springtime, all that stuff. Uh, it kind of works overall. They have the other thing that's like a dream fight is a part of their, uh, like, dream, logo. Dream star fight, I think. Yeah, dream star fight, yeah. <laughs> so they, they, they have that. They still got the little connection with who was started with the stars they're doing that dream star fight right now in terms of the roster it's who we knew plus uh you know nanai and now like was when they had introduced it at first now was the big surprise i kind of figured nanai would be there mm -hmm. uh you know you know it, it, like it makes perfect sense when you think about it uh now it was a little bit of a surprise uh, you know, she's somebody that's still relatively young in her career. She's been, been around for a few years, you know, maybe four, three, four, like, type of deal. She was somebody who was an ice ribbon for for a while. Uh, and, you know, and she, like, was doing, like, very sporadic shows recently. Like, she was a part of those prominent shows uh, that are, are kind of going away, it looks like, uh, pretty much. That's very interesting, too, a very interesting timeline that just like one or two weeks ago, Prominence announced that they will be discontinuing their re uh, regular shows in Shinkiba first string. Yeah, yeah, that did happen. Uh, well, this is a big step up for her <laughs> like, sure. from Shinkiba <laughs> going here. Uh, if you know anything about now, too, she was one of the ones – I kind of talked about it earlier about Ice Ribbon. It's funny because it's kind of happened <laughs> this way. She was one of the ones when they had when she left. She was like, "The reason I'm leaving is because president the president sucks <laughs> of the company." <laughs> uh, she didn't say it exactly like that, but it was literally like her exact words were or not exact. It's never exact with translations, but it was like more or less like, uh, "You know, I've lost so much trust, uh, and I ha I hate him so much that I had to leave because I can't be happy <laughs> if if I stay here." So she left, uh, all of the confusion going on on that. Now she gets a shot in Ice Ribbon. I think if you haven't seen her from Ice Ribbon, she did have like a very brief foray into stardom last year as fake Tom Nakano. Yes. As, which they mentioned in the press conference where she's like, I'm not Tom, I'm myself. <laughs> I want to <laughs> give a shout out to the cage match Yoshi Discord. Specifically to Peps, of course. Oh yeah, Peps. Krinoya, Jonas, and Karlsruhe zero zero specifically, because they helped a lot in putting together the notes. Uh, I could just follow the links they they provided in the Discord, so it was easier for me. And Jonas here said, if uh, Rossi Ogawa doesn't get Tam, he will take the doppelganger. 
I mean, that's that's what it's all about. You know, they need they needed their top idol star, and they turned to now the fake Tom Nakano <laughs> to, to to make this work. But yeah, that was like the one surprise like of, of everybody before uh, the foreigners. They're like, if you really look at this roster, it's almost like exactly the style of stardom was originally mm-hmm. yeah <laughs> like you know it's not that different and i and i kind of tease this like again this is another thing i talked about if you look at his history he's done this three times now where <laughs> he's left the company and had to start a new one uh you know so and it's always kind of the same playbook whether it was Arceon, they had the jd star deal and then stardom itself now uh, i didn't think they were getting all three of the founders of stardom in, in there right <laughs> away but and that's kind of brings us to the next point Yes. Uh, which was the actress girls came out. Right. Uh, where you had Fuka and six of their uh, top stars. Yes. Miku Aono, uh, Natsumi Sumikawa, until that point, the champion of actress girls. Uh, that is no more, of course. Misa Matsui, Koki, Shiaki, and Shika Goto. Some of them we could see at actress time in All Japan Pro Wrestling. I gotta think that that is a thing of the past now. I was going to say, you kind of stepped on my lead here. I was going to say the big loser of all this was Fukuda. (laughs) (laughs) He can't do his... What's going to happen to actress time now? Yeah, yeah, I mean, what's what's going to happen to actress girls uh, as a whole? That's the question here. Um, I want to quickly read out what Fuka had to say at the press conference. She said that about the end of last year, she she had heard from wrestlers uh, that... Actress Girls was getting tough for the wrestlers. But what these girls are aiming for, Fuka said, is a theatrical environment. Representative Keiji Sakaguchi allows them to only do their own plays, but he doesn't allow them to go outside. And Fuka continued to say that we were no longer a professional wrestler organization. And the only thing we were doing was wrestling, even though we did not call ourselves professional wrestlers. In that situation, the players were lost, she explained. And as for Fuka, she was not going to leave the group, but she suggested a two-group affiliation with Marigold. She said there are a lot of girls and actresses who are not allowed to join other groups because of their large number. I thought that if these girls were to join this group, Marigold, the extra time would be used to give newcomers a chance. I want to suggest that it would be a good relationship for all of us if the wrestlers who became well-known at Ogawa's place returned. But before we could talk about it, we were told that it would be difficult to continue under the current structure and we would be terminated. And after repeatedly asking, are we dissolving... She was told by the president, we will disband on the 14th at Shinkiba. And so she decided to go to Ogawa. That apparently, I asked around, and apparently that was a threat by the Actress Girls president for them to not leave the company. But this threat apparently was not very successful. So (laughs) these these wrestlers left nonetheless. And so, yeah, that's... That's also part of what we said earlier for the other Yoshi companies. They are not in a very good state of their business. And apparently the roster that Actress Girls had wasn't even bound to the company with contracts. So, Oops. yes, leaving Actress Girls, of course, it's Actress Girls, especially in our circles in the West, they have build up a cult following in the last couple of months. And you know, as well as I do, that Sondre and Yannick are big fans of Actress Girls. But it uh, seems like that that company, um, if it's not going away, it will be looking vastly different from now on because these six wrestlers are the top performers of that group. And they are gone now. And they are joining up with Marigold and... We were wondering about the roster, Dylan, and we had these five or six or seven wrestlers in mind. But with with these additional six and also working with the wrestlers that Monday Magic provide, that is a very solid ground that they have now. Yeah, that is a good point, actually, with the Noah stuff. And this will be at Wrestle Universe. Like even Wrestle Universe was promoting the press conference yep. uh, yesterday. So 
Like, that answers any doubt about that. Uh, the actress stuff, uh, you know, it's one of those things where, obviously, like, the stuff you were reading and, and saying there, or she was saying there, it's interesting. I mean, actress is such a, a weird company, like, in, in the scheme of wrestling, like, in Japan. But these all left. Uh, like, they, these girls all left. Fuka came back to Rossi. They've always had a great relationship, so it's it's not, like I said, it's not that surprising, actually, that she would come back. How they handled it was something that they probably could have done a lot better, actually, because yeah, it was literally like 15 minutes before the press conference, and then it came out that we've got an emergency announcement, uh, and like they're, they're all leaving, <laughs> like, pr- pretty much. Uh, so it was literally like a 15 minute thing. Like I, they could have handled it a little bit better <laughs> in terms of, you know, time passing. Like even the startup stuff is stuff we've known about forever. Like these girls yeah. leaving and stuff. So them leaving isn't that big of a deal now. Like because we already knew it was going to happen. Uh, not that it's not a big deal overall, but just that we already knew that these people were there. With actress girls, it was like 15 minutes. They're here and then they're gone. So I wish that they had handled it a lot better. You don't, you shouldn't do that. No, in my opinion. That's, that's really shady business, and really not common for Japanese pro wrestling. I mean, we had individual wrestlers leave for a for another company, but not with such little notice to the company. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think that's another thing that kind of made it so shocking for the fans. I'm not surprised that these girls will want an opportunity elsewhere, to be honest with you. Uh, if you. If you look at the size of the companies, this is going to be a big step up and a big yep. opportunity for yep. them. And if you want to be in wrestling in Japan, actress girls isn't – it's one thing like some of these companies, they're down. They might not be as popular right now, but actress girls is not just not popular but actually not respected in other like company circles like that's why they don't wrestle in all these other places because they like they said like our maxes like are not real like re- wrestling we do not do wrestling it's not the same thing they said all of this stuff we're using points to determine it, uh, that was a bad look to a lot of these other companies mm-hmm. uh you know and, and like a lot of the companies wouldn't use them because of that when you announced that you know essentially that wrestling is not real that really hurt their rep with a lot of the other companies, not the fans, uh, because they were able to build a a little bit of a fan base, not huge, but uh, they were trying to get some fans. But a lot of the other companies didn't like that. Uh, And we saw how difficult it's been, like all of the havoc that wreaked with, like with actress time in all Japan. Now, now these six get a chance to be in a, a quote unquote real, like the the, the very real all shoot world of Mary Go <laughs> Pro Wrestling, they, because that's very real. I mean, it's kind of silly when you think about it, but n- nevertheless, like yeah, that's how part, it's part of the deal. I mean, when Fuka took the mic, she said, "I came here because I wanted to wrestle." Although she probably might not wrestle herself. Yeah. <laughs> like, maybe but, we, we came here to wrestle. Maybe that. Yeah, so with that said, uh, that's an opportunity for them. The roster, you know, you you look at it, and I have to say, I don't think this is a great roster, actually, when you, when you look at it up and down. You've got the pieces up top. Like, you've got the three, maybe four folks up there. You're Julia for however long she's here. You know, no, nobody knows in reality, like, how, how yeah. long she's going to yeah. stay like I, I, it's not even really worth speculating on. It could be one show, it could be two shows, it could be a, a year before she leaves, for all we know. But she, you know, we all pr- proceed to predict that she will leave eventually. You've got, uh, you know, Utami uh, and, and Mirai, who were stars of note in Stardom, and you've got Nanai, who's a legend in in the uh, Joshi scene overall. You've got, and then a lot of younger talent and maybe unproven talent. I thought that it was interesting, and and on top of it, these six girls in particular, we've seen their reactions. Like when they have came to to all Japan, it's not a one for one comparison, 
but the fans really hate them because it, of their reputation. Yeah, it's going to be very interesting how they are going to fare in these circles and how, not only how the fans take to them, but also how the other members of the Marigold roster take to them. That is true. Uh, you know, we'll see how it goes. With If Fuka's there to speak for them, I think that she can smooth it down because Fuka mm-hmm. is very, very well respected. Uh, you know, and hopefully if she's on board and they're on board, I, you know, hopefully it's not too much of a problem there. But the fact of the matter remains, these people aren't big stars I mean, if you're trying to, to move up. They're younger talent you're taking a risk on, and some of them are talented. Sumikawa was there the first time, like when she was Shozuki. Like, she was there in stardom, like, uh, you know, before. I liked her back then. Like, she was still very young. Uh, she was one of those, because if you look at the history of stardom, there's a cavalcade of people who were there hmm. very briefly, <laughs> like a year, two years type of deal. And then they, even, like, Hoshiki was, like, that's how it was with her. She was there for a couple of years disappeared for five, seven, eight years, or however long it was, and then returned, like, mysteriously. As, as something similar happened with Shozuki, where she came back, but this time Fuka brought her back in actress. Uh, but she's a good worker. Uh, you know, and that, I, we talked about that on the All Japan show. I felt bad for the ones that were there, because the fans hated them so much, but the match itself was actually not that bad. I'm not sitting here saying they're going to get you, you know... They're not Shuri. Like, not, none of these women are at that level or anything like that. But they wrestled all right. Like, you, they're all right. Uh, and you have to hope that you can get something more out of them with all of these. And the whole roster, a lot of young talent. <laughs> the foreigners, again, direct play from basically where Sardom was at the start of their run. So, there, were, you know, how they did it with the actress girls, I wish that that had been a little bit different. Uh, you know, instead of just, you know, right away, immediate type of deal. But regardless, the roster itself, I think they're in a little bit of a, a rough spot. I don't think this is a great roster in total, uh, even though they at least have names now. I, it, it is bigger, at least in terms of quantity, than a lot of these smaller companies as well. Uh, so you at least have that. I think they have a ways to go, though. I like they need some people some more people, and we know that they're going to come eventually, like the people who are under contract in stardom, but I I still think they need a couple more. I don't know, but I mean, they're starting it off well, you know, with the Monday Magic thing, and also they announced the tag match, like Julia and X versus Sari and X, so you've got that Julia and Sari hook to start the company off with. After that, I don't know. Like, where where can you go after that? That's very interesting, definitely. Let's say if they also can make out a deal with the prominence wrestlers, they would, for example, have Risa Sarah there. That would be another good piece, another veteran that they could have. Um, Mochi Nasumi, Akana Fujita are still there. I'm wondering what... Uh, what Maya Yuki is doing right now. Yeah, you know, well, and, and a lot of these people like uh, Yuki, there's some of these people that maybe don't, even if they don't sign contracts, like they're probably going to have a lot of the same, you know, freelancers that they are. But, but I know that he wants to be, and if you look back at Stardom, this was true as well. Exactly. He really wants to be insular, like mm. all his own, like, you know, like not work with all these outside people that yeah. much. Uh, like, that's why they're recruiting, like they stated that off early on right away, uh, pretty much. But I thought it was interesting that they announced they were like, uh, they were, because somebody had asked something like, what about working with DDT and TJP? And he was like, nah, <laughs> like, pretty much. Uh, you know, so he basically already said he was like, Bima is so big. She, he said it was 10 times bigger than Bushi Road uh, sure. going to a Bima Tower. So shots fired. Shots Bushi Road. Fired. But he's already saying that he doesn't want to work with Tokyo Joshi Pro. So, um, you know, they'll have to re- they'll have to recruit. They'll have to bring it up, which, again, is basically exactly how Stardom worked the first time. And we'll see what they can do with, with that overall. But like I said, when I look at this on paper, they have the benefit of the former stardom people, which I already talked about. They kind of devalued all of them in the last year, if you look at their booking. 
And this is their test to see if that uh, rubs off on this new iteration of them or if they're able to build something big. I do think Julia Ansari is, like, the best possible way to start things off, like, that you could do in the, in the current scene with what you have. I think those are probably the two hottest names. Well, sorry is definitely the hottest name. Julia is talked about a lot, uh, even though she wasn't doing a lot on the actual shows in Stardom for a little while. So uh, I think it's probably the best they could do to start off. They'll probably hope to build around this core, and hopefully they can do some big things with it. Yes, I think there is as much as we can say about it right now, because there is, except for the match that you mentioned, no cards so far, and we'll have to wait and see. Finally, final topic of the show, Dylan. We are going to look back at Windy City Riot from this past Friday in Chicago. And we're also looking at some of the cards that were announced for the upcoming shows. So, as I said at the beginning of the show, John Moxley is the new IWGP World Heavyweight Champion, something that I totally expected. I, When the f match was first announced, that was my gut feeling, and it yeah. came true. John Moxley won the title. We had a bunch of matches on this card, lots of title matches, lots of multi-person matches, actually two multi-person matches. Uh, what was your overall take on this Windy City Ride show? I'm asking because it has a really high rating at cage match of 8.24. Yeah, we kind of talked about uh, this yeah, yesterday off the air. Um It was a good show, don't get me wrong. Uh, I didn't think it was a great show, personally. I think a lot of this rating is going to de depend on how you felt about the main event, really. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you were big into that, that has a high rating, so it makes sense. Like, you know, the, like the same people voting that high voted the whole show high, uh, pretty much. So it makes sense. I think that there were a couple of matches I really liked. And then there was a lot of stuff that I could, like, had interest on paper, but I don't think it really, like, paid off wherever we went on the show. Uh, so I think it was an up-and-down show, but more good than bad. Like, there was yeah. nothing outright terrible on the show, uh, I, I would say. Uh, you know, I, even though I, you know, the Riot Rules match didn't really work <laughs> for, for me. I'm wondering why they are so content on doing these matches because it feels like that every big strong show or New Japan America show they have has one of these multi-person garbage brawls. And they weren't really equipped for it either, like in terms of like following, like everybody's brawling around the arena, <laughs> you know, like in different places, eight men yeah. like, going all over the place. Like they wasn't the best shot, the like, most well shot match to say the least. Uh, so you had that. I don't know. Like, what, what, did, what did you think of the show? So first of all, I, I thought the main event was really good. I wouldn't say that this was any kind of outstanding match that you have to go out of your way to see. Maybe you have to go out of your way to see because it's a title change for the new, new yeah. heavyweight title. That, that you can definitely uh, bring up as a point. But other than that, I thought it was a good match with real good pacing and They are, there was this moment in the match when Naito wasn't able to do his uh, Combinacion Cabron, where he didn't, we seemed to, that he wasn't able to go over the top rope. And I thought that they were leaning heavily into the idea that Tetsuya Naito is a champion on his last legs. And I'm really thinking that they are kind of building this into these matches now because they are also talking about in Tokyo sports. Remember when... Uh, When Yota Tsuji had the match, they kind of went in a similar direction as well prior to the match. And so the pacing was really done well with Moxley and Naito going really slow at first, but the finish picked up steam heavily and uh, there were some big moves that were, that were shared there in the final moment. So that worked out well to make it a good main event for this. Yeah, this really good show. Yeah, yeah if you want to talk about the main event, I will say this. The crowd was really into it. Like, yeah. this was clearly, like, a big drawing main event for the show, and I will give them that. I personally didn't think it was that good, 
mainly because of Naito, <laughs> to be honest with you. Uh, I, I like Moxley well enough, uh, and you could see that, like, Naito, like, so strongly has an aura and charisma that he can get by, get by doing this. But for me as a fan, when I watch his matches, I think he's had a really bad year. Like, in general, like this title reign was not good for him at all in the ring. Even when he won, I thought it was a very below. It's hard to, like, even grade him because it's obvious his body's just in mm. shambles at, at, at the moment. Uh, but I I did not think he was very good here at, at all. And he was doing his best, and he got a lot of uh, crowd heat pretty much. Uh, Moxley wrestled the best he can to make something out of it. and. The crowd loved it. I didn't think that it was a great match, though, to be honest with you. I, I can see a lot of people liked it. I think the title change like gave it a little bit of a boost, like an upgrade uh, for me. So it didn't really enamor me, the match itself. Uh, like you said, I think a lot of people thought Moxley would win. Like I said, I, th- I, I said it before. If it were up to me, I wouldn't beat Naito. But I also kind of figured that Moxley would win. Yeah. So it wasn't like a big... Surprise there. The semi-main was Nemeth and Ishii, which I thought was... I said it on the show I did on the Patreon when the show happened. Mm. I think this match would have come across better if it were the opener. Like, we, we didn't have all of this stuff, uh, like, beforehand on it. I mean, that part. was... Like, it was like... You had a, this weird card, too. Like, the... Ali and Hiromo match and the Riot Rules match kind of, like, burned down the town on the show pretty much. Like, it, it, it was kind of killing the show and definitely the vibe. Like, I was like, like, this show's struggling. Like, like you know, that was like an hour, of, like, after entrances and the, the thing at the angle at the end of the the brawl match, uh, setting up Kingston and Gabe. So it's like that t- took down. They kind of bounced back. But I think this match would have been better as the opener than the semi-main. Yeah, because the actual opener wasn't really good with Renarita and Minoru Zuki. No, oh, that was a bad choice, just stylistically. I, Never mind that it sucked. Like, but just stylistically, yeah. it was a poor choice. I think they, if, I mean, of course, they feel like they have to put singles matches like Nick Nemeth and Tomiyuro Ishii in bigger positions. That's what they always do. So if there was another choice, I probably would have chosen Stephanie Vaquer and Asumi as the opener. Well, I mean, that was the second match on the card, yeah. so it's not like it's a big difference, but like... It is a big difference, though. If you're opening the show with such a match like Renarita and Minoru Zuki, or you could open it with uh, with, a, with a quick-paced women's match, that's a difference. Well, yeah, well, yeah, the women's match, yeah, that was the best match on the show to me. Like, you, you could argue. You uh, could argue. Like, uh, you know, and, and Nimbus and Ishii could have worked as well. I just didn't think they really brought it. Like, when you're having... Yeah. It's not like it's a it was a bad match or anything. It was a good match, mm-hmm. but with Ishii, you you have a certain standard you expect, and this clearly did not meet it. Uh, you know, I would argue. I'm, I don't know. I I liked what Nick Nemeth, for example, did at Bloodsport that worked well, but I'm not feeling him in New Japan Pro Wrestling so far. And um, I'll, I'll give Nemeth this. I get the feeling when I watch him that he's not here like he wants to be great. Like he actually wants. I think wants so that. as well. And it's not like he's here just collecting a paycheck and goofing mm-hmm. off like someone else. <laughs> we, 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 you know, we'll talk about it in a second. Uh, he's here because he wants to be great. It seems like he really likes wrestling. He's doing all these different things. You mentioned blood sports. So he's the effort is there. It's not really clicked yet in New I Japan. I don't think they did him a favor in giving him a belt right away. That's, that's another problem. With, initially. And that's another problem with this match. You were type saying like, oh, they have to have these big singles matches. Why? Like, it's not a it's not a title match. Like what? Like what was the point of this match ultimately? If it's not even a title match, they even said like Tanahashi is like like what was the point of this yeah. overall? It wasn't a big match with like by their standards. Uh, you know, so it was basically an exhibition, to, you know, and it it didn't enamor me. Like I said, it, yeah. it didn't grab me the way I, I wished it would have. Uh, the TV title match, you could make the case that was the best match on the show uh, just by pure wrestling. And, and as I said, uh, it's very rare in wrestling that you get to see toe work <laughs> in, in there. And Zack Sabre Jr. brought us this with the, 
<laughs> the anomaly of shoeless, <laughs> uh, bootless Matt Riddle here. Um, they worked together really well in this match. Uh, yeah, they had like a really good chemistry. I, I was kind of surprised and impressed at the same time. There were several red flags about uh, Matt Riddle. First, <laughs> first, of course, all the red flags that were pointed at him when he was announced in January and uh, everybody that felt that it was the wrong decision to bring him in at that point can feel vindicated right now, including me. Uh, he... And everyone, <laughs> I think. <laughs> yes, and everybody. There was a match with Jake Oman that I think was not officially for the New Japan World Television title, but it kind of uh, was alluded to by Riddle, I think, that it was a match. It was on a show um, of the Squirt Circle Expo on March 30. And on this show here in, on the English commentary, I don't know if it was brought up by Walker Stewart or by uh, Chris Charlton. I think Chris Charlton said it, that Zack Sabre Jr. originally didn't want to go back to the division. And that to me was kind of, it seemed like kind of an insight to, yeah, man, we asked Zack Sabre to just save the day for this one, to get the title back off of uh, Matt Riddle and to just uh, carry it for another couple of months before we can figure out a new champion. So everything about this Matt Riddle deal seems like it was a bad idea. He just danced out after the match. And, uh, man, I've... Uh, in the last couple of months, not seen anyone that burned a bridge so effectively like Matt Riddle did here. Yeah, this is like Nakajima times 10 here. <laughs> uh, he just walked off laughing and dancing. The crowd was he like gave him heat. Like they were booing him in the match too. They, they were totally against him. I don't know if that set him off. Uh, he's nuts. Like we, we all know that. I said it before, like whatever you want to say about him, like as a person and all of his crazy outside the ring, like craziness that he's been a part of. I thought he was kind of overrated as a wrestler in general. Like I remember when he came in to evolve and at all that he's done, I never was that big a fan of his. I will say this match worked out well. Mm -hmm. Just in terms of their actual wrestling. I think they made it work. And this is some of the smoothest work that I've seen from Riddle. I himself here, but of course, it all go like goes up in flames afterwards. Like, you know, he he burns the you know burns the bridge, like you said. I mean, if it was me, he would have been fired. Like I mean, like I said, we wouldn't have gotten here. I like, I wouldn't have brought him in in the first place. But now that he is, you do this, this kind of makes it seem like he's done. <laughs> like they, this is the end of the line. They took the belt off of him. What was the point of all this? Like last few months of this TV belt. <laughs> like it was basically like you did the thing with Tanahashi only to immediately flip it to Riddle and then go right back to Zach. Like, what What? What was the point of this overall? And and we're going to Cobb. Like, we're literally in the exact same place with this title we were a year ago. <laughs> There's no growth, because they had a rivalry before, like last year with Cobb and Zach. Like, no growth, no point. I don't know. Like, I, I don't love the belt where it's at right now. And this really just feels like in typical New Japan fashion, yep. a sign that they don't want to do anything new or different. They just want to do the same stuff that they always do. They bring in new belts, and they are treating them exactly the same all the time. And this is even a new belt. Like It was around for like a, over a year now. They're just mm -hmm. doing the same stuff they did last year. <laughs> like I said, when, when there's no growth at all. It, instead of putting it on Tanahashi, that Zach Rain was good for what they wanted. Like like the original TV title reign. Yeah. That should have been used to elevate one of these other guys, like the youngsters. Like the, like one of those guys should have beat him and had a great run with the TV title. Not a few weeks of Tanahashi and then Riddle gets brought in. That, that and now we have Cobb. And just like I said, they it was Zach and Cobb last year. Like they had a rivalry for this belt last year. They had multiple matches. Yeah, uh, they're that's, doing... It's kind of damage control. We're going back to what we know worked well for this title, and uh, we'll see what we what we come up with next. And it did work well, especially the second match uh, in their series. Like I thought was really good. 
Uh, and I like Cobb. Like uh, Cobb is a really strong wrestler, a talented wrestler. Uh, and I liked him on commentary too, even when they when he was on there uh, at Sakurai Genesis when he stepped in. So I'm a, I'm I am not against this matchup. Like two talented guys. The problem is that we just did this a year ago when we're doing mm. it all over again. Uh, you know, and the title it, he never should have lost it in the first place unless it was to one of the younger guys. It should have been Umino that won this or something like that. Uh, overall, but the match itself, I'll say this was good. It's kind of like. Does it really even matter, though? Like, And I kind of have a problem with matches like that. Uh, same thing with the Nakajima and Anzai match. Like, there was good work in that, but ultimately it really was erased by the – like, it, like it was basically rendered meaningless by the post-match, and I kind of feel the same about this. That's yeah. why I like the women's match a little bit better than this one, but I do think this is up there as a match of the night. The Riot Rules match, like you said, crazy brawl they always have on the show – uh, they did the thing where it's like, because Coughlin retired and all of that, they had an extra spot on the War Dogs team, and they called in Kenta to be the, the big heavy hitter to replace him. Um, and I was thinking about this. Like, Kingston brought in Homicide, who at yeah. least makes sense yep. like for, for him. And it also kind of makes sense if, if you don't have any other friends that you at least bring in the enemies of the Bullet Club in Cobb and TGP. Yep. But I was thinking, at one point, Kenta and Homicide, that would have been a dream match. Yeah. Like, you know, a legendary match. And now you see them coming in as the seventh and eighth guys in this match. And, I mean, Kenta, there's literally, like, Kenta was the worst wrestler on this show. Like, and it's not, it's not even close. Like, I, I would argue. Homicide is not where he was before. I either. mean, of course not. This man has been resting for 31 years. Yeah, exactly. But I just, I'm never a fan of seeing guys who I used to be huge fans of and were legendary performers. Yes. And then you see him now, and it's but like, oh. I thought it was really effective how they used him because they Homicide, choked him yes. out. Yeah, they choked him out, and they made Eddie Kingston watch his hero being choked out. Yeah, that was the best part of the match. It was actually. the best part of the match, so that really was was well done. Yeah, it, I didn't love the match, though. Like, it felt like they tried to ki kind of recreate the style they had with the cage match, and this fell so far short of that, I, yeah, I would argue. Absolutely. Um, uh, but they did set up Gabe and uh, Kingston in a, in a last night standing match. For the strong match. title, I... Um, I think that Gabe Kid is winning that title that gives him something to hold on to while well he challenges for the Never title too ooh wow could he unify the Never title and the Strong title it'll be just like the Continental belts yes, where... yes. The, the Pacific Championship all Pacific new, new Continental <laughs> title here yeah. Yes. Um, but yeah, they're going to do another crazy ass brawl on next month's show. <laughs> like, yeah. pretty much. With, with, and there's probably going to be interference from all these same people. <laughs> like, uh, again. Yeah, and uh, I just said I, I'm not really feeling Nick Nemeth. And I'm also, I don't know, I'm not really feeling this run of Mustafa Ali. Oh. I think the best match that I've seen of his so far was the match in France on uh, January 6th against Aigle Blanc that I really liked. It has a rating of 7.82 on Cage Match. It's uh, available free on YouTube. You just wanted to flex and say his yes. name like that. Yes, I wanted that. And... Um, Except for that, I saw some of his matches uh, on the indies. Uh, the latest one I saw was against Amazing Red on the Revolver slash House of Glory show. And I'm, I'm not, he's, he's okay in, in the ring right now, but it's not like he's doing anything that makes him really stand out as a wrestler. And when you think, Dylan, of course, that, is, that has been years ago, and Hiromo Takahashi isn't the same wrestler that he used to be. But the matches that Hiromo Takahashi used to have in America, for example, with Dragon Lee, they were matches, now that we talked about the high flyers, the, uh, the high flyers that can change the scene, 
yeah. matches that Hiromu Takahashi and Dragon Lee used to have in uh, New Japan Pro Wrestling, they were these kind of matches. They were pushing mm-hmm. the envelope. Yep. And this match also was built up as kind of a dream match between uh, wrestlers from two different continents that came from two different uh, companies and are now here in New Japan Pro Wrestling. And it was just not that. It was even aside the comedy that they did with uh, with good old Daryl here that Daryl yeah. bulked up. <laughs> uh, even aside the comedy, it was just an, a very decent wrestling match and nothing else. Yeah, about that amazing red match. Uh, I love the venue that they were in. For... Oh, the venue is great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Church. Yeah. Mustafa did this in church here with amazing red here. They put on that main event. They did a they street fight where they actually brawled out onto the street. So they brawled out of this church to the to the streets and back into the into the church. That was a great visual. Yeah, and it's funny. Another guy who, I mean, Red. It was like speaking of innovators when yeah. he, when he was around. Like he set the stage for all these people that came after him. Pretty much when he came in, there was literally nobody like him, and there were a lot of copycats that came after him. <laughs> Now, he's actually aged a little bit gracefully. He doesn't wrestle that much anymore, but he's kind of sl- – you know, he's not doing the same stuff he was 20 years ago, but uh, he's aged pretty gracefully, I, I, w- yes. I will say. Um, Ali, I'll say this about him. I liked his run and impact. He had a great – like what the match he won the X title against Chris Saban was a good match, like really good stuff. Between them and another guy like Saban, an like innovator in the past who's aged very well. Like, and I think that he's done a, like a really great job. Actually, I still think he's a really good wrestler. Um, that match is worth checking out. The problem with Ali is, as soon as he hit the Indies, he started doing this president gimmick, mm. and that told me that told me his mindset right away. That's not what you do if you come to the Indies hungry and wanting to have great matches. That's what you do when you want to be a gimmick to where you don't actually have to wrestle that hard <laughs> anymore. And I've heard about him that his prices are pretty exorbitant uh, on the Indies. He doesn't come by cheap, uh, Ali. He knows his worth and uh, maximizes his value. you got to give it to him. He's a great talker. He did a great yeah. promo after this match, too, also questioning why he's not in the best of the Super Junior. He called it... Um, Good question. Some... <laughs> Yeah, he called it, uh, what did he call it? Somewhat uh, adequate Super Juniors, I think he called it. (laughs) It's a good question why he's not in the tournament, but, uh, I mean, I guess he's not in the tournament because the schedule doesn't match and maybe New Japan doesn't want to pay the price. They needed Hayata. So, like, there's just that. Clearly needed the GHC National Champion and not the TNA X Division Champion. They needed Blake Christian. They needed that GCW uh, like yes. cre- credibility <laughs> in their tournament. Um, but yeah, you're right. He is like a. That's the thing about him. I've always loved his work. Like I thought he was a great wrestler. Yep. Uh, like in WWE, so many people fall through the cracks. <laughs> like you know that that cut gum in there. He was one of the more egregious ones, though. Like I would say. I mean, the whole retribution deal. <laughs> That's one of the things that, like, marks your career. And they they were still joking about it, him and Haste on there because they were both in it. Uh, thankfully, man, Mikey dodged that, that bullet with retribution. Uh, but they were joking about it, and Ali was like, why are you like this? Uh, very funny on Twitter. And I like Ali. I like his personality. Him as a person, like, just everything he's shown on Twitter is a really great dude, like a really good guy. Absolutely, yes. Uh, as well. He's got a lot of ideas, very creative. Even in WWE, like he, he did a lot of stuff that other people weren't doing. Uh, helped shoot his own videos. Uh, he really wanted to succeed, uh, even uh, you know with, with everything that goes with that environment. Uh, like you said, great talker as well, very charismatic guy. But the gimmick told me what we were going to get, and that's basically what we've got out of him. And this mm. match... Was and, and for all things considered, a gimmick match like with him and Daryl and, and Hiromu and all of this, which the crowd was into Daryl to be fair, you know, in, in a way that it kind of worked, I guess, for what they wanted. But if you told me these two guys are wrestling four or five years ago, yes. I think, oh man, match of the year, like you know, like that level of match you would expect. And this was not even in the universe of a match of the year. It was like. 
some decent comedy. It didn't really grab me, but it, the fans liked it. And the finishing stretch, they did win me back a little bit to where it was oh, like an above average match. That's about as hard, far as I would go. Uh, like, and uh, the finishing Didn't, stretch was good with the sunset bomb into the 450. I thought they executed that well. Yeah, that's, that a, was, that's about that was nice and stuffy. Yes. Given that he talked about the best of the Super Junior and he him not being in the tournament backstage, I kind of took that as a, as a possibility that they would do a rematch between the two maybe at the finals of the BOSJ, or maybe somewhere down the line in June at Dominion, for example. This is another match. Why wasn't this a title match? That is a good question. He, and he was going to, he won. He, like, he, he, yeah, he won. Yeah, like what, what would have stopped this from being, that makes so much sense for Hiromu to want to go after the X title on top of it. Uh, really dropped ball on this show from that standpoint. I think both of the, the matches here. I don't know if it was some TNA initiative that that our belts, you know, yeah. our TNA you know, can't, can't have the title match on a big New Japan show. No, no. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. But wrestling is stupid sometimes. <laughs> sometimes. So, yeah. but I mean, I just there's no logical explanation for why this wasn't a title match. Uh, maybe they are gonna save this. Uh, for something, or maybe uh, Ali could face somebody else. I, I would like to see him get another chance, but watching him wrestle, I've watched all of his matches that that have been online since he's came to the Indies and into TNA. I don't know if he really wants to be that dude anymore. Like when when I watch him wrestle, and I like you said, I I, don't, I can't blame him for it, and he's a good talker, but I don't think the fire is there to be in that push the like he's already done that already like his first indie run where he got signed in the first place and Hiromu I don't think his heart is in it either to be honest with you when would I watch him wrestle and if we're bringing back Daryl and that's that's his big story but I honestly think remember he had that loss to Doki as well mm -hmm. you gave him another loss yes the stars are kind of aligning that yep. he is one of the favorites <laughs> going into the tournament. And he tournament was the name Logic Baby. And he was the name that stood out when I looked at the, the lineup. So it wouldn't surprise me ultimately if this leads to a big bounce back and he wins the tournament. It'll probably be a solid tournament followed by a great final that everyone sees, which is kind of what happened last year. Uh so That's we'll see. Best of the Super Junior spoilers right there. We'll have to see the final day, night of each block before mm. before we give our stories. Yes. Like th those are the rules of tournaments, but uh, it does seem like they're building a story around him with these l losses. We also had Shota Umino defeating Jack Perry in one of these situations that are so funny that yeah. neither guy can 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 really afford a loss right now, especially not Jack Perry after he came in with his huge entrance and all the uh, officers or what 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 uh, the SWAT unit or whatever it was that came uh, with him and they were standing there ringside he was leaning heavily into the shtick he into the uh of course the footage that was shown on dynamite he was leaning heavily into that doing headlocks and a front neck hold to Shoto Umino as well and uh a couple of weeks ago, we talked about him, and it felt like he was really checked out in New Japan, in the New Japan Cup. I thought that he did extremely well in this match, leaning into the crowd that was booing him heavily, of course, in Chicago, and playing with it a lot. He looked really happy to be in a position like this, to be performing in front of this crowd, and just uh, being able to play this kind of role as the as the anti-hero. Shoto Umino, on the other hand, he looked decent, I thought, in the match. Nothing that particularly stood out to me. It's good for him that he got another victory. And uh yeah that's are, uh, are you kidding me? Did you see that ending stretch with that innovative move set that he had, that elbow strike to the back of the head, oh, followed yeah. by the double arm DDT? I've never seen moves like this. No, no I've, I've, I've not played a lot of uh, WWE on PlayStation 4, so I've never seen that either. 
<laughs> well, I, I don't even know if they have the hidden blade in those. I don't games. know. But maybe, they maybe they maybe they did. Yeah, they should. It's a, a good, very good video game move. But yeah, I'm obviously stealing Osprey's and Moxley's moves there. Yeah. Uh, this whole match was made because of the crowd. Uh, to me, which obviously, like all of this was set off by AEW and, and their CM Punk footage that they showed, <laughs> which was straight comedy <laughs> that they, they decided to do that. Um, you know, it's one of those things where. Like, nobody actually won from that, but if anybody did... Well, CM Punk won, because he got more over to their AEW audience thanks to that. They've insured CM Punk chance for the near future for FTR and Young Bucks, so that was a great decision. Uh, but if anybody came across sympathetic and all of that, it was Jungle Boy. Like, you know, if you watch the footage and what they tried to do. And if you notice, even in this match, he was booed heavily. But there was also some people that supported him in Chicago that actually like it yep. made him more over and sympathetic uh, to the fans, which probably wouldn't have happened if you just watched his Japanese run. You think, oh, this guy sucks. <laughs> like there would have been no support. But because of what happened, he actually had the crowd. He played into him really well. Uh, you know, he was doing stuff, like you said, doing the CM Punk stuff. He did the knee strike, teased to go to sleep, which uh, showed him admittedly did have a great counter to uh, with the DDT. Yes. Uh, out, out of to go to sleep. Uh, Commentary, that, they were joking that, that Kenta had to be furious backstage. Oh, no. Not another backstage <laughs> incident. <laughs> uh, no, not that. But, uh, yeah, uh, you know, they played into it really well. But it messed up the match. Like, this is a kind of an issue I had with the women's match I'll talk about, but especially this match. Because of the video it kind of like threw off the dynamics of this match, like the face heel dynamics a little bit where all so much of the focus was on Perry that it made Umino not shine mm. as much. Uh, I actually thought he wrestled pretty good. Like Shota d did here. I think he's really grown a lot as a performer and this was a good match for what it was, but ultimately you would want uh, more shine to be on him after winning. Even after the match, it's like, after all of this heel stuff that in the match, Jack Perry shook his hand and then went immediately to flipping off the fans. It's like he like what do I do? Am I heel? Am I babyface? Whatever. Like like that's kind of how the match ended. And I don't think it really this win gained a lot for Shota, ultimately. Yeah, I agree with that. What was uh, it about the women's match that you want to say? No, just that well, first of all, we cannot forget the, the brilliant, strong tag team title match. Yes, we can. Well, it was like 10 minutes. It all led to an angle. Yeah. TMDK is the champions. <laughs> no, so big night for TMDK. Nichols, Haste, and Zach all getting titles. Uh, match was not anything to write home about. Uh, the women's match was the best match on the show to me, uh, as I said. But one thing I noted that I didn't like, actually, about the start of the match Vaker played to the crowd at the start. And, like, she is a, probably a bigger star to American fans coming off of the Mercedes match and all of that. But it really messed with the dynamics of the match, in my opinion, where on paper these two are such a hand-in-glove fit stylistically. The power brutalizer wrestler versus the high-speed person, like which Azumi is, like, the best at. But I think when you went with the babyface stuff early on, it kind of messed with the face-heel dynamics a little bit. Uh, and I wish that they had played it more like Vakir was more of a heel in the match. I think it would have been even better uh, with how it was. It, and I noted that, too, because I saw a couple of reviews on Cage Map saying Azami no-sold everything. Mm. But I didn't actually think that's true. Uh, if you look at it, she was affected. You know, she she did a lot of the moves. And I don't think Stephanie's leg work was actually that prolific. They did that one thing with the dragon screw, which looked great. I mean, Azami took a great bump for her on the outside. But she still sold it. It still affected her. She didn't, like, oversell it to where it was, like, changing her yeah. entire match. But I thought she at least made it better, which is all I asked for out of, out of a wrestler, pretty much. Uh, so this is a really good match. Uh, they did go into the power speed stuff as well, which uh, both women did a great job at. Again, they're like a hand-in-glove fit when you look at them coming in there. Ozzy threw it against the wall uh, with a lot of stuff. And uh, another thing... Like, this finishing stretch was so good with all the counters. I didn't like Vaquer's finisher, which was kind of like a backbreaker-ish move. really anticlimactic in comparison to what they did before. 
Yeah, exactly. So those are my two issues. The beginning and the end, I would have changed those. I think you could have had a great match. I think it's a very good match. Like, you know, three and three yes. quarters would be where I, where I rated this. And I'd probably give the same to the TV title match. But I didn't think this was like – this could have been even better. If they had more time, too, that's another thing. I mean, this was a 10-minute match, ultimately. If you could – they could have really built something big and had a great epic finish. And I think if they had played more to the heel-face dynamics, it would have been a great, great match. And I still think it was really good and the best match of the show. But I would have tweaked those things. That's just my commentary on that match. Yeah, I don't have anything more to add to this show, to be quite honest. So it was a good show. Well, Some the opening match stuff. sucked. Uh, and, yeah. you know, yeah. like, and it led to the main, like, we kind of glossed over this in the main event. No, I was actually going to go there, but oh, okay, go, on. go on. Go on. No, go, go on because you started right now. Well, yeah, like, Moxley was talking and saying he nominated Shota as the next challenger. Then Narita came in and attacked him with his push-up bar that he had. And Moxley was all like, you graduated from a young lion to a dead man. It's <laughs> actually, actually a good line. It was. Like, I like Moxley. Like, I, I, I think he's... Yeah, he feels choice. so genuine. Uh, he, his celebration after the match felt so genuine. They had... Uh, he... Yes, of course. It always seems like I, I, I said that after the match. Um, it always... Seems like that he unlocks a new stage of his being whenever he's bloody. It feels like he turns suddenly, and we talked about Dragon Ball a couple of shows ago, he turns yeah. into the Super Saiyajin when he turns turns bloody. And uh, he, he, I mean, they had uh, his wife, uh, Renee, talk about his passion for wrestling that returned, and that's especially great when he's a new to Pen wrestling. So that, that felt like a real great moment for him. So yeah, this brings us then to the next set of cards, Dylan, for the upcoming tour for wrestling, Don Taku. Road to wrestling, Don Taku, I will just mention all the title matches, not all of the cards that we have. It begins on uh, April 23rd with a match for the Never Never Openweight Six-Man Tag Team Championships. The new team, the new champion team of Hiroshi Tadashi, Toru Yano, and Oleg Bolton, the young lion, wins the championship right here. They face off against Evil, Yujiro Takashi, and Yoshinobu Kanemaru. On April 27th in Hiroshima, there's two title matches, and I don't think I want to watch that show. It's first for the strong openweight title, Hikoleo and Fantasmo get their rematch against Jen Haste and Mikey Nichols, and the Kyo PW 2024 title is on the line as Red Okan defends against Yuya Uemura. Then we go to Golden Week, April 29th. In Kagoshima, there is a match for the IWGP Junior Heavyweight Tag Team title. Driller Maloney and Clark Connors defend against Hiromu Takahashi and Bushi. Okay. Yeah, yeah baby. For <laughs> the IWGP Junior Heavyweight Championship, we have Show the champion against the belt holder, Doki. It's, uh, it's, it says it's Show's second defense, but it's actually Doki's second defense because he beat Kose Fujita in a great, great match in Taiwan just, uh, just a couple of days ago. Then we are at the double shot for wrestling Don Taco on Friday, May 3rd from the Fukuoka Kokusai Center. First night of wrestling Don Taco. New Japan World television title. Jeff Cobb challenges Zack Sabre Jr. And Hiroshi Tanashi challenges Nick Nemeth for the global heavyweight title. As well as on the second day, three title matches. Chase Owens and Kenta, of course, have to get their rematch against Hiroki Goto and Yoshiashi for the IWGP uh. Tag title because they, for the life of them, they can't have a, another a different tag team title match. Gabe Kid challenges Shingo Takagi for the never title, and in the main event, we have John Moxley against the Dead Man, Renarita, for the IWGP World Heavyweight Championship. And fans were making fun of Renarita of how weak of a challenger he is for John Moxley's first defense on Twitter. It's hard to blame him. <laughs> like, these I shows mean, are not great. No, these shows suck. Like they, that you that you led. Like this is the big matches they've had. Uh, I mean, what is there to look forward to on these cards at all? Like none of those matches have my interest. <laughs> to be honest, I think Shingo and Gabe has a chance to be a really great match. I I really like Shingo. A gay, if they have a brawling style match, I guess yeah. you could do it. Yeah. yeah. 
I, I'm not that into the War Dogs, to be honest with you. Like, uh, the, the the game and all that stuff, his crazy promos, <laughs> it, it's for someone, just not – I'm not saying it doesn't work even. I'm just saying I personally don't think it's that interesting, like, the stuff that he, he does. But we saw last year with him and Kaito that they could do some really cool stuff. Like, he could do some really cool stuff. In the crowd really loved that. Yeah, let's hope that this can – like, if they could get that, that energy for this, yeah, it could be pretty cool. But, I mean, I don't – who knows? It's a never title. Who knows? Who knows? Like, what, what could happen? Uh, but definitely for the main belt. Naruto's not going to win the title like, over, over Moxley. It's like his ba- big win building up this was against Suzuki, of all people. Like, like it's, not, yeah. it's not like they built this up for anything. It's just an excuse to have him in a title match to kind of artificially elevate him. And we'll see if it works. I'm sure there'll be a lot of goofy stuff in this match as there usually is in, in these matches. What do you think about Moxley? Like, yes, you thought he would win the title, but what do you think about him as the champion and his path forward? So I just opened up the cards, the full cards for Resting Don Taku, and I was looking for a singles match of Shota Umino's, but he on the first night, is in a six-man tag with Moxley and El Desperado against the House of Torture to build up the title match on the day after. And on the second night, he's in a even further down the card in a in a eight-man tag match. Hiko, Leo, El Fantasmo, Shoto Omino, and El Desperado against Evil, Yujiro, Sho, and Kanemaru. So, after Vinny City Riot, John Moxley wanted to say that he's defending the title against Shoto Umino next, but it doesn't seem like that this is the direction they are going in. The direction to me seems like that the winner of the special singles match on the first night of Dontaku between Yoda Tsuji and David Finlay will get the next title shot. And that seems to be the match that was planned for the final of the New Japan Cup. And I think it was planned that David Finlay wins the match. And I think they are doing that here. So yeah, the they, next... they yeah they pretty much made it kind of obvious by, by making this exactly. Match. And so the next one would be John Moxley and David Finlay, which kind of makes sense in this yeah this, that that Moxley is kind of this brawler and he gets to wrestle with the House of Torture and with the Bullet Club War Dogs. Yeah. So I think that Moxley for the time being is a good champion for New Japan Pro Wrestling, and I've said it before. Now, in the meantime, when he's champion, they have the opportunity to build up those that can be champion in a couple of months down the line. I'm still thinking that Tetsuya Naito will eventually win back the championship. However, in the meantime, there are there can be defenses against Renarita, then David Finlay, and maybe they can do the match against Shoto Umino, but... To do that, they would actually have have to build them up, and it's not looking like he's in any kind of big match on this Dontaku tour. With him, I can easily see him them doing something with him in America, because you've got resurgence in That's May. Right. That's right. <laughs> For Ben Door is going to be in June, mm-hmm. if you want to do that. So you've got options. Like that would be an easy match. Like everyone knows the history between Moxley and Umino. I would prefer if they built it up, like built up Umino, but it makes sense. Like if you're, if you don't want to do that, you don't want to build up Umino for whatever reason, you could put him in an easy match for U.S. audiences at Forbidden Door. Uh, like that doesn't need to have any build up or anything to it because yeah. the fans already know their relationship, uh, pretty much. So it makes sense on that level. You've got the Finley thing if you want to do that. Uh, either, again, you have Resurgence if you want to put him there, or, or Dominion if you want, and it's all building up to uh, Naito getting the title back at Seoul. Like, so it makes somewhat sense. I don't know if it really does anything that wouldn't have been accomplished with Naito winning, to be honest, or, like, retaining the title. I, I think you could have done all this stuff, and you would have gotten a similar result. The only difference is you wouldn't have the Moxley and Umino match, which I think helps AEW more than New Japan, which, I mean, what a surprise. <laughs> That's the main focus uh, for them. Um, yeah, I like him as champion, though. I, as a fan, 
I don't really agree with the decision from a booking standpoint or a, like a business standpoint or anything like that. But just as a fan, I would way, way rather watch Moxley have these matches than Naito. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, like if, if it were me. Uh, but I know a lot of people love Naito. Like he's the LIJ guy. Like he doesn't have to wrestle good. Like people try to defend the Wrestle Kingdom match and he sucked in that match. Uh, like, you know, like he will get defended by his fans no matter what. Like he's still very popular. It doesn't even matter. But for me, I am not a fan of his. So I, as a wrestler, so I'm happy with it. We'll see where it goes. I don't love the idea of just, hey, we're dropping the belt in in April just to win it right back. You know, like that doesn't really enamor me. On top of it, we've seen this exact same angle ran with Naito himself three times <laughs> where he wins the belt at the Wrestle Kingdom. Everyone says this is the time he gets yep. his big yep. title reign, and then he loses it by by April. He like, we've never, seen it. Never gets that. It could have been four if they did the right thing and had to beat Okada in the Wrestle Kingdom the first time. So it's like we're doing the same. This is another thing with New Japan. It's the same stuff over and over. There's no creativity, no differences in anything. I am not into what they're doing right now. Even though I like Moxley as a wrestler, hopefully they could use BCC to have matches with these people and have multi-man tags. I was also tags. thinking that, yeah. You know, I like hopefully they can do that. But other than that, you know, we'll see where it goes. Again, the matches like him and Shota could be a good match. Him and Finley could be like a brawl type of match. You you could get something out of that. But just the story of it and the booking, I don't really love it, actually. Uh, but I'm sure it'll be fine. Like I said, I respect his work and uh, hopefully he can have some big matches out of it. But I, I wish there was more creativity up and down in this company. Yeah, me too. Me too. For what it's worth, right now I I'm looking positively into the future for at least John Moxley's title run because I it seems like that he's really in for this run and it seems like that he's going to be off a WTV uh, at least for the tours when he's in New Japan. They already announced that he will be returning to Dynamite with the championship, but uh, he seems to be at least on this. For uh, for some dates on this uh, wrestling Don Taco tour, let me quickly check. I want to see what uh, what the cards say. For example, for the 27th in Hiroshima, uh, yeah, there's no John Moxley. Okay, he seems to be in at least for some dates for New Japan Pro Wrestling. So we'll see how much he actually works with the company. Uh, and that is that is that. I think that's as much as we can say about New Japan and their situation right now, right? Do you think this title reign benefits New Japan or AEW more? AEW, exactly. Like, that, that's a, that's an issue to, to, to an me. Issue. Yeah, yeah. So I can't really be that positive, like no, like knowing that answer uh, overall. So we'll see what the end game is too. Like even if Naito wins the belt back, I guess we'll see how that affects the G1 going forward, which we'll yep. get to in due time. Exactly, we'll get to that in due time. Uh, we discussed a bit, we discussed Oiwa's chances a bit here on this show, but we'll definitely get to our uh, expectations for the G1 climax in the next coming weeks. And yeah. That has been it, Dylan. Uh, I really liked that we got to do this show and talk about so many different promotions, of course, including the big one with New Japan Pro Wrestling. We went over so many Yoshi topics that we usually don't talk about. It was a nice, nice change of pace, definitely. I'm always happy uh, to give the Joshi companies their credit. I don't think they always get uh, the most respect or the best coverage in the West, to be honest. Uh, just in general, so I'm very happy to try our hand at it and, and talk about them as they deserve and respectfully as they deserve. Hopefully, like I said, the the scene itself is at a very lean period right now, but maybe with this Marigold thing starting off, uh, you know, again, I'm not super into the roster right now. Like, I don't think it's a great roster on paper, but you've got promotional backing. You've got a new company on Russell Universe uh, to bring in. Hopefully they can make some waves and you can see all of these companies. And we talked about it uh, last, uh, you know, earlier with the stardom working in the wave, having Tall Saya catch the wave. Maybe 
these companies can grow and you can get some big things in the future for them. And, and hopefully we can talk about them more. I would love to do that personally. So hopefully we can do that in the future. Yeah, sounds like a great idea. So I want to say to the audience, to the listeners, to you, thank you all for listening to the show and goodbye. Sayonara.